Hello again, everybody, and welcome to another exciting episode of the Jim Cornette Experience. I'm Jim Cornette. I'm a rotten person, and I'm co-hosted with a rotten person. And today we're going to talk about rotten wrestling and then a palate cleanser with a classic wrestling episode sure to please the most discriminating palate. But to join me in this fiasco that we're once again going to pull out of our ass Hawaiian Brian, the podcasting lion, the king of the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network, Mr. Co-host to you. He's a terrible human being who double dips and never puts the toilet seat down. Your friend and mine, the great Brian Last. These are completely untrue allegations you're leveling at me, but aloha, Jim. And a pleasure to be here once again. I'm not rotten. I put the toilet seat down. I don't know. You double dip. I don't do- I double dip if it's my own private stash of ketchup or something. That does make a difference. It absolutely does, but I prohibit anyone from double dipping in a shared ketchup community like setting. So you are saying these allegations are specious. That's right. At best. I've de- you know what, it just I've heard these things from people said about you, but I've found out this past week it not only depends on the person telling the story but it also depends on who that person is telling the story to, what these people's stories sometimes are. But that's a lesson for another day. You know, I wanted to cheer ourselves up today, Brian, with all the negativity that's been in news, of course, the global pandemic, riots and looting and fires in the streets, uh, inept leadership in the United States of America, hopefully only until November. With all the things, and, and, and the wrestling world crumbling around everyone, I thought it would be nice today. We're going to have a palate cleanser. We are going to talk about some current wrestling for those folks who just have to hear that type of thing. But also the main event of the program, as they say, we we went back and actually, at least I did for the first time in, was that 1980s? For the first time in at least 25 years, I watched the entire Clash of Champions 1 from TBS. The big one, the one that started it all. In its entirety, we're going to talk about that today, as well as doing one of those watch-alongs that we do every once in a while uh, for the Midnight Express and Fantastics match, so we can break it down from the inside, inside baseball today about wrestling. I guess you wouldn't call it inside baseball when it's about wrestling, would you? I guess not. Inside wrestling, a former after mag, but that match that we're going to do the watch-along for has one of my favorite spots ever that I've never seen anyone else copy where you hold the table up and (laughs) Tommy Rogers gets run into it. I've never seen anyone else copy that. We're going to talk about how that came up on the sperm of the moment. Um, (laughs) But that's later on in today's program. And also, I wanted to be positive, you know, and be in a good mood. Uh, uh, There's a lot more people in the world more miserable than I am, it appears like these days, every time the news opens up. But... uh, I also, just for example, you know, I, I, I wanted to go back and, and enjoy some fond memories, Brian. I went through some family pictures, and I'll have you know I found pictures from the first family vacation that my dad took me and my mom on when I was two years old, went down to Dallas, right? Saw that, went down downtown there. I just barely remember it. I was so young, but I remember we saw a big parade in downtown Dallas and my dad found a great place for us to sit. It was this little, little hill, but it was all grass. It was so nice and green. You could come on, you could sit right on it. And, and then we left quickly. I can't remember what happened. I guess that we were trying to beat the traffic, but then I was looking through these pictures. I noticed that day my dad was a, a, a rifle collector. He had this one rifle in this picture. I never saw it back home again but uh but that was my trip to dallas in 1963 I, what are you doing here and, uh, I, don't, I don't understand well i'm involved in everything right oh oh, that's right that's right yeah i thought you were gonna say there was a man with an umbrella there's all sorts of these weird what figures a man with the umbrella isn't that one of the things in the Zapruder yeah. film? There's a man with an umbrella, but it's a sunny day. Why does he have? Why does he have? The yes, umbrella? why did he have that umbrella? It must have been a signal, and possibly a, a hiding a radio transmitter. Um, but anyway, speaking of transmitting, <laughs> I'm transmitting. If I, you're still you're you're still giggling at the previous bit. It fell flat, and we moved on. I'm still giggling uh, at the idea of two year old Jimmy Cornette sitting in the grassy knoll for the parade. <laughs> 
<laughs> I love a parade. Uh, and, you know, and I've always loved bookstores and book depositories and things <laughs> like that from my childhood. Anyway, I mentioned I was transmitting things to the general public and not virus germs. Um, all of the Cornets Collectibles customers that ordered before the the pandemic overtook my website on June 15th, everything through June 14th has been now officially shipped except for the last remaining 25 international packages and eight of those pesky packages containing the custom-made Mid-Atlantic DVD sets that will be accomplished this weekend. So the rest of that goes out on Monday, and then this week we will start the process of transporting some 400 action figures boxed up, labeled up, signed, and shipped to their awaiting adoptive families. Uh, and that's going to be a period of several days because I'd I've realized that if I did them all at the same, if I just waved my hand and twinkled my nose like Samantha Stevens and they were all signed, wrapped up, and done, I can't get them all in my truck. I would have to rent a rider truck to take them. So it, it's good. But over the next... What is today? We've lost track. We've done so many shows this week. And today, as the people are hearing this first, is Saturday, June 27th. Is that correct? That is correct. Well, by the latter stages of this week, those figures will be headed out, and they will all be finished up the following week uh, out to the customers. And then I still may take a few days off before we reopen the website store. If you go to jimcornett.com, you can now. The site is back up. We've mentioned this, but the store is down while we catch up on this backlog. Everything's done custom, folks, and I'm signing as quickly as possible. And also, there's the I'm restocking. We're, we're looking at, at movable shelves with wheels now to put into the garage that I've already had custom renovated to hold storage. So we have more shipping supplies, more merchandise. We don't have to keep ordering and restocking. Uh, this is a thing we're doing, um, and as I mentioned, we're working and having conversations on a brand new website with an expanded server and a, a better functioning store that takes more methods of payment. All this stuff's going to in the works, but it's going to be a process. So, till the middle of July or so, and Daddy gets a couple of days off, uh, we're not going to be back open for merchandise sales on the website. We'll give you updates, but mid July, that's the, the estimate. I know you're, I know you're waiting for a shirt, Brian. I'm sorry. Well, if you're having this much trouble managing the load right now, I can't even understand what's going to happen this Christmas season. Figures toy company releases the first ever Jim Cornette hot tub play set <laughs> with bathrobe and pipe and whatever else is going on over there. <laughs> Uh, you know, I honest to God, <laughs> I was at the post office the day before yesterday. Um, you know, Bree asked me, said, when the action figures come and I said, they're going to be starting, a, you know, a few days, whatever. I, and I said, you know what we what we're going to do for Christmas, don't you? And she said, what? I said, we're going to have the Jim Cornette post office play set <laughs> with with optional window clerk and the, the dolly. I take the packages in on. And the little packages laying on the desk and everything. And you can make, because that is literally now my only, as I mentioned, social interaction. So in the next coming few years, I'm going to be known as as the the minion of the post office. So you can, you can put me in there with the packages. They can be sent out. Maybe even we have an international version where they've got a customs set up in the back. <laughs> See, I think the hot tub place set is topical. That will just fly off the shelves. The post office place set that's probably a long-term sale thing. But I think even if we did a custom Jim Cornette office, that would be cool. People would want that. So you could take your Jim Cornette figure, open it, destroying the value of that autograph, and stick right. it in the Jim Cornette office. Wait a minute. Did you say office or orifice? I said office. Get in the Jim Cornette orifice. Well, you're, you're right. They may buy the post office as more of a a collector's item that you want to keep and own. I'm sure the hot tub play set would be played with numerous times, but, um, does it come with a hunchback? The post office. Play <laughs> <set>? <laughs> <laughs> I've, now with optional hunchback, that's like when the, the idiots, I always, I hated 
I always loved the idea of, yes, having wrestling figures for fans and the wrestling toys, but they made them so stupid during the Attitude Era because not only were the... You would always see that in the early days of merchandising, the toy company would fuck something up because they didn't know anything about wrestling, right? And and in those days, if somebody else besides the WWF did get a deal, then they'd go, well, you do it. And they wouldn't be hands-on, and you'd get something that was goofy or looked stupid or facts were incorrect, whatever. But with the WWF, when they started merchandising in the Attitude Era, some of the people working in the office didn't know anything about wrestling. And they'd just seen that shit that they'd just been doing for a year. So all of a sudden, underneath guys, preliminary guys, got dolls, figures, that's great, but they would include with optional bashing chair and it, or like breakaway table or toilet seat because they did a street fight on raw when one of the fucking toy company people happened to be there. Several of the guys had toilet seats in their goddamn figures packages because one of the fucking guys, cause I'm sure I know who might've written this came out of the goddamn bathroom with a toilet seat around his neck. So for two years after that, guys had toilet seats and plungers and all these ridiculous implements that had nothing to do with wrestling in their packages, and I hated that. See, one of the biggest mistakes I could say as a kid who grew up in the 80s with lots and lots of action figures is the LJNs were just this big rubber figure. You couldn't do any moves with them. You could pose them. You could throw them at your sister. (laughs) <laughs> like you couldn't actually do anything with them. You had to really have an imagination. Then they went to Hasbro, and the WWF figures had like one signature move. Like you could bend the guy's arm back, and it would come forward with clothesline action. And then WCW <laughs> started doing mini versions of the LJNs, just a posed figure, couldn't really do anything. And then eventually the Attitude Era, those figures, now they have this weird waist where they could bend at the waist. What everyone's missed the mark on Wait a minute, a weird, well, hold on, a weird waist where they can bend at the, what do you usually do at the waist besides bend at the waist? It's not even the waist, it's almost like right under the breast, like the abs, there's like a weird <laughs> thing to bend there, but the way everyone's missed the mark is, they should have just made G.I. Joe type figures for wrestling, because anyone from the 80s, who grew up in the 80s or yes. the 90s, who collected G.I. Joes, you could do any move with those, that's why so many of us had G.I. Joe wrestling federations as kids. Body you slams? Anything. Any move. You can send the guy yeah. to the ropes. You can come off the rope. You can move any way. But wrestling figures, you Suplexes. can't do that. Suplexes. You Everything. can do that. And and I'll tell you one thing, though. He had, he had the G.I. Joe with the Kung Fu grip. Um, But also, if you wanted to bring in giants into the territory, there was a fucking set of fucking battling Vikings that came with these the horses and the chain mail and the supposed you know armor which was plastic obviously but you could dress them up and they had swords and clubs and everything but when those fucking vikings peeled that fucking shit off and they were standing there next to gi joe and they were a good fucking two inches taller they looked like a tag team of andres boy and when the vikings fucking invaded goddamn and the whole federation quaked in horror sounds like a money feud and as a matter of fact, we're going to be talking here shortly about, because we did also watch um, a wrestling match broke out on All Elite Wrestling the other night, and we watched that, and also I watch anything involving MJF, so we're going to talk about that, but there's a lesson to be learned there about people who never progress from booking their Vikings to come in and terrorize the territory against G.I. Joe and his Kung Fu grip. Um, but before we talk about anybody else not progressing, I think, Brian... I'm optimistic unless President Pig shit figures out a way to in some way use the power that he's got because of the position he's in to completely fuck the fucking voting and fuck the election and rig it and steal it and whatever. We are beginning to see signs of life of mourning in America, a little awakening. The bulb is coming on. Biden is leading in all the polls. Trump can't get his own head out of his own ass where it's been, but he's been successful with it there to realize that people are starting to see through him and his bullshit and they ain't happy. And then, and I asked you this right before we went on the air, you said you saw part of it, but he gave a speech, Joe Biden did, 
in Lancaster, Pennsylvania earlier this week. And I don't know how many times we got to say this, but this no longer even comes down to whether you're a Republican or a Democrat or what you believe the right ideas of what should be done in this country are. Just the simple, obvious, uncontrovertible fact of standing Joe Biden next to Donald Trump, hearing both of them speak, and then not understanding that Donald Trump is an ignorant, self-absorbed, lying moron who is only out for himself. It's That's why there's all this, what they call on the right side, the Trump derangement syndrome. Because people are triggered, as they say, when this guy stands there and blurts shit out of his anus-shaped mouth on the spur of the moment that he doesn't know anything about, lies, has no feeling for anyone, no knowledge of anything that's going on, appeals to the lowest common denominator, and is completely obvious about it, not only his ignorance, but his criminality, and the fact that he doesn't give a shit as long as he's reelected. They see that and they go, what the fuck is the matter with the people that are still standing there nodding their heads up and down like cats following a flashlight on the wall? Joe Biden gave a speech and the the Republicans are painting him to be sleepy Joe and he's, he's lost it and he's senile and he doesn't have the mental acuity or acuity to be the president. Look the fucking idiot we've got now. That, that trips over his own tongue every try, time he tries to go past three syllables. Biden was articulate. He meant what he said. He clearly addressed everything. He had emotion. He had passion. He had conviction. He told everybody what he thought of the entire situation and Donald Trump and his leadership and in a clear way that everybody could fucking understand. And what he need wanted to do and will do and need and that needs to be done. I don't know, like a president, like somebody that ought to be running this shit. And anybody that can stand there and listen to him with what he said, and then listen to any time that Trump farts out his face and not realize that there is a major difference, and it is in the Biden favor of a guy who knows what needs to be done, knows how to do this shit, a level-headed, reasonable, responsible adult human being, and a fucking blithering dipshit. There is, it's, it's obvious and it's not disguisable. And at this point, you're just lying out your own asses if you don't admit it. And if you will take a mentally unstable con man as the leader of the free world and the person who's supposed to represent all of us, just because you think he's going to fuck up the fucking Supreme Court and stack the judges or get rid of abortion for you or whatever the fucking ridiculous idea you've got in the first place is that anything that he's done should have been done, then you're a fucking traitor besides being an idiot. Have You think we could take four more years of this shit? Fuck. So at any rate, if anybody hasn't listened to the speech Joe Biden gave in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and what was it? Uh, was it Tuesday, June 23rd-ish or so? Listen to it. There's the next president of the United States, and he's going to do something to fucking mitigate these disasters and try to restore some of the shit that Donald Trump has fucking broken or revoked or rolled back or whatever, that Joe Biden was res partly, partially responsible for doing in the first place, he's now got to come back and fucking fix because of the fucking lunatics that thought this fucking sack of flesh cells should be the president of the United States. And look where that's got us. So at any rate, Joe Biden will be the next president. Check out that speech if 
Trump doesn't fucking still do something to rig this because he's already rigged the court, he's rigged the judges, his fucking clown car of criminals are starting to get off or decisions overturned. He will pardon himself at 11.59 p.m., his last day in office. I make this prediction. And Brian, write this down in your little black book, wherever you keep it, that I did this so we'll know what show to come back to when Trump pardons himself before he fucking leaves with his head down in shame. But we got to make sure it's a blowout because who knows to what extent he's going to be able to monkey with the fucking voting. So this can't just be close. It needs to be a fucking blowout. I mailed my vote into the Kentucky primary, but I will be there in person in a hazmat suit to vote against him in November in person. And it might still not do any good in Kentucky because as we've mentioned, Louisville, Lexington, and fucking Hooterville around us. But I will still make my voice known in person and everybody else Remind everybody what kind of pickle they're fucking in if we get any more of this. I've, I've, I didn't see him causing a pandemic. And he didn't cause the pandemic. He just ineffectually dealt with it like he's ineffectually dealt with anything else that might make him look bad. And the United States has a quarter of the cases in the fucking globe and the only major country where, a civilized country where the, infections out of control and the rates are on the rise because obviously there was no leadership at the top. He had his 1986 UWF moment the other day where he got to Tulsa and he said, where's the house? <laughs> and it, but it, Hey, to be in all fairness, at least Herb Abrams had talent on the card. Oh, I'm talking Bill Watts, UWF. Oh, I thought you meant the beach brawl. No, no Tulsa. Um, well, and once again, you look at he's left with the same people that are clinging to this same shit. Everybody else has seen through him. The moderate Republicans, if there are such a thing, um, the a lot of the evangelicals who say, oh, he'll get rid of abortion. Well, even now they're saying, but he's such an evil human being. Um, of course, he milked the rubes and the sapsuckers in rural America. I'm going to bring coal back. Going to bring your jobs back. <clears throat> he didn't bring shit back. Uh, it, 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 unless you're working on the fucking stupid, goofy wall that we didn't need that he's wasted people's time with. Um, the only people left are the people who will go out amongst a bunch of strangers slobbering all over each other and not wear a mask because America and guns. He'll never lose the gun bunch because they're the ones that want to see the military in the streets to beat up all these fucking hippies and Jews and protesters and Negroes and things. So he'll never lose the gun bunch, but the, the moral bunch, the evangelical bunch, at least they're supposed to have souls and consciences, consciences. So I believe he's, they're slipping away from him. And even the business people, he's such an embarrassment. Even the billionaires, he's such an embarrassment. A lot of them might stick with him for the fucking, you know, free ride they're going to get on taxes and fucking the rest of the country. But some of them have turned on him. The gun nuts and the racist will obviously never turn. So you've got 6,000 gun nuts and racists in, a, un, in an enclosed building, unmasked in Tulsa. That may be a natural selection law, but then they got to come out and they got to infect all the innocent people who don't buy into their fault or all. So I've, I'm not wanting them all to get sick. I'm just wanting them all to go the fuck away. Did you see that video out of Florida? I only saw part of it earlier. It was on Twitter where I guess Palm Beach County was having a hearing and people were allowed to speak up and say what they thought about Yo, being yes. forced to wear masks. And people were saying how, you know, God put us here to breathe, not to wear masks. And it was insane. Yes, a bunch of fucking idiots they, and uh, wearing Trump shirts. They're trying to interfere with God's beautiful plan for our breathing. It, you can't argue with these people because you're arguing with people that are mentally deficient and can't follow a cognitive thought or a logical, sensible fucking conversation. You cannot give these people. You, It's good to put them on display every once in a while so we know they're out there. 
But you can't give them a chance to fucking speak. They don't do their own. Co- you know, I, there's a lot of people have been speaking lately and don't do their own causes any good because people see through to what fucking mentally deficient and or agenda motivated uh, idiots these people are. But they genuinely believe this. These fucking mouth, don't cover our mouths. God meant us to breathe. Yes, he meant you to breathe without the fucking COVID. So don't fucking blow your goddamn COVID-ridden fucking snot and fucking droplets all over me, you non-mask-wearing douchebags. <laughs> I'm telling you, this will be the next fucking hate crime because I, w- I am waiting for a non-mask, ma- non-mask, a non-mask-wearing motherfucker to do what I saw the other day at the post office, he went right, there was a guy standing at the window and he wanted to ask the clerk a question. So he just walked right up and leaned around and over the guy's shoulder and asked the question. Any, anybody that comes within six feet of me, not wearing a mask and talking in my direction is getting a fucking hand in the fucking mouth. I'm just telling you, I'm going to cover it up one way or the other. You should start carrying a racket again. Well, you know, the, that worked for when they threw stuff at us in the arenas, but I can't figure out how to bat invisible germ droplets. Um, speaking of invisible germ droplets, there's some modern wrestling going on, uh, it, despite all of the virus and the COVID and all this stuff. They're still trying, um, but... <sighs> I thought this was supposed to be the product of wrestling having been cleaned up over the past few years by all the 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 wonderful dedicated people and the inclusive people and the the good people that have gotten rid of the bullying and the abusing and the assaulting and the all the stuff that we had back in the 80s apparently that I've heard about all that old carny stuff they call it now we never talked about people being carnies in the eighties, but now they talk about all the carny stuff. It's what I guess they come up with buzzwords, but Brian, I've heard for a number of this past several years now, how just how rotten and crime ridden and drug abusing and infested that wrestling was in the eighties, how everybody was horrible people. The, the fabulous moolah was crucified for being a horrible person. Um, it, the business was just so dirty and dark and sinister back in the eighties in those carny days. And now we finally progress that where there's, there's none of this dirty, despicable behavior. And now everybody's clean and nice to each other. And women are equal to men and everybody plays video games and, and, and drugs are bad. Okay. Um, and we're finding out apparently that that's not the way that it's, it's been. And I'm not going to talk about anybody specifically because now everybody's going, oh, Cornet, well, you were involved in it. <laughs> well, I was involved in the shit back in the 80s. I just got drugged downstream with all this shit this year. Uh, I was standing on the bank when the fucking flood came. But without even talking about any specific case, the biggest thing that I'm seeing from reading what anybody has said from reading about any account or accusation or whatever is the ridiculous over the top amount of effort and coercion and time and this campaign that some of these people went on to systematically continually browbeat or, or bully or harass somebody into fucking around with them or the links they went to, or the time they put in at the bar, and the fucking, the the whole effort of this thing. And I'm saying, what, this sounds, they talk about my generation of pro wrestling being so wild and wild west and no rules and improper and unprofessional. This sounds like the biggest goddamn high school fucking drama that I've ever heard of in my life. And it's ridiculous. <clears throat> and I just want us on behalf of the eighties generation. I may be the only one, one of the only ones from that generation that still accurately remembers everything. And I can tell you one goddamn thing that shit did not go on. There was nobody. I mean, there's always through history 
and people can cite cases of there being dickheads in every line of work. And did any pro wrestler before last year or two years ago or three years ago ever sexually assault somebody? Sure, they did. There's been a few cases that's been documented. Or just harass someone or was be a dick. Of course they did. But as a whole and overall, it, the, the supposed rock and roll 80s, there was a whole lot more consensual debauchery and a whole lot less bullying and position pressing and threatening in order to get anybody's way. I never, when in the 80s, you saw major arenas with five or 10,000 people or more full of fucking people screaming over the goddamn wrestlers who were rock stars. And out of those many thousands of people, just like when you go to see Van Halen first, I'm Van Halen, folks, I'm not making this up i'm just reporting it a lot of women went specifically for the idea of trying to hook up with the wrestlers and the wrestlers because they were rock stars and many of them wonderful looking and physical specimens didn't have any trouble talking anybody that was on the fence uh, over to their side of the th the yard it, it, it there was no First of all, the whole idea of, and most of this has not happened with fans. It happens with other people in the business. So let me get the fans out of the way first. The accusations here recently I'm talking about. There were multiple, multiple fans, female fans, that would do pretty much whatever the fuck that the wrestlers asked them to do and be happy about it and go home thrilled for the experience. So there was very little bullying or coercion or continued browbeating of these young ladies to do something that they didn't want to do. I hear the, these stories of, well, the fans had been around and this one guy kept winking at me or the meet and greet or the audio. Well, there weren't any meet and greets anyway back then because the people were already in the building and the boys were being paid huge money in a lot of cases, most territories for the time. So they didn't need to go out and mill around. We went and milled around for our own recreation and where we knew that the young ladies were milling around waiting for us to come out and mill around. And if it was a place where you stayed overnight often, all the fans then the girls knew where the guys stayed and what hotels, where the heels were, where the baby faces were, whatever the case. They would go back to the hotel. There was no pursuit of these innocent young ladies by the wrestlers because they were going there to meet the wrestlers. And in some cases for some of us who didn't go out and drink and carouse, I'll have you know, by the way, I never went to a hotel bar during my years on the road in the eighties as a manager of the midnight express. Not once. Cause I didn't need to. I didn't, I wasn't going to drink. I had already probably either made arrangements for the evening or I could just go back to the room and call Domino's and wait for the phone to ring because everybody knew where we were. But a lot of the guys did go out to the bars and the clubs and they hit on a lot of women and those women either accepted or they didn't. And if it, it took probably about 30 seconds to a minute to determine that. I can't, if somebody had actually pursued, if some guy, especially one of the top guys, especially around the horsemen, had spent an entire night in a bar trying to talk a woman into doing something with him and failing, he would have been crucified unmercifully in the locker room, verbally, by all the people that witnessed it, or even if he did it successfully, but he spent that much time on it. So the point is, you could have companionship if you wanted it. Not everybody did that type of thing. 
but it it it, it wasn't a situation where you had to browbeat or bully or pursue or coerce anybody into doing anything they didn't want to do because there were there was no reason for that and <laughs> as i mentioned you know in some cases guys that didn't drink or go out and party didn't have to leave the room and there were in many cases towns especially in, in every territory because of the regular circuit that the fans knew about or even in the carolinas when crockett was spreading out where the fans knew you didn't the crockett guys didn't stay over in fayetteville north carolina they went back to charlotte or they didn't stay over in greensboro or whatever the fuck so in some cases you had young ladies that had their favorite wrestlers and had an ongoing thing. They never even saw the matches. They would come to the parking lot, to the building. And then if you would see your friend, they'd wave and, and you would go sit and hang out and chat in the car for a while. They didn't go in and watch the fucking show. They just came to hang out with the guys. So that covers the the fans and uh, the ridiculous idea that somehow it was this den of iniquity that all these guys were preying on unwilling females. Flair would do the promos. Come to the airport Marriott in Philly, folks, right after. And the four horsemen are going to be there. We're going to party all night, blah, 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 blah. And that's the desired response would take place. They would all come. As far as people in the business, or, you know, I'm hearing that a lot of these are aspiring female wrestlers or even wrestling female trainees. But help me understand, are some of these girls in England being accepted in wrestling schools, Brian, at the age of 15? From what I've read with all these stories, and it's easy to get overwhelmed by the amount of stories and the amount of different stories. I don't know if it's just limited to England, but. Apparently, there are wrestling schools that accept minors, and in this case, minor women, into their training classes, and that's where some of these instances have occurred. Okay, if, here's another thing. What the fuck? Why would you do that? Why would you put young uh, uh, high school and college age guys... Potentially fucking, well, I don't know if they're jacked up on fucking hormones anymore or not. They're already jacked up naturally on hormones. They were on steroids these days. Holy shit. In the close proximity of underage teenage girls to begin with. Um, any training program that I've ever had anything involved with to do with or, or knowledge of. OVW never took guys under 18, much less girls. I, I mean, I can't. Uh, well, I can't actually say if I wasn't around at some point, maybe Trailer Park Trash or somebody might have taken a fucking 17 year old kid if he was fucking huge. But we, you know, but no, you, if, if it was found out, it would have been stopped. But, um, but no, you don't take underage guys or girls because that's a huge liability that I believe was in our paperwork and our um, insurance, what I'm trying to say in OVW and a ring of honor. We have had a couple of times applicants. Uh, for some of the camps that were, and no, to get back to us when you're 18, there's insurance liabilities, etc. cetera. Rene Dupree, he had trained. I mean, his father was a promoter. He grew up around the business and also he was fucking six foot three and 245 pounds and built like fucking bricks when he was 18. They sent him to us when he was 18. He could have been a pro wrestler three years beforehand visually but not fucking in the eyes of the law as far as in kentucky and etc was commission <clears throat> point is no first of all if you're a, a, a legitimate training school program and or you have something to lose you would never take anybody under 18 the guys like Bobby Eaton and Terry Gordy and the, the young teenage prodigies of the old days, that can't happen anymore. They they broke in in a different time and a different era. Um, and, and, and the promoters they broke in for were judgment-proof. Secondly, this may be indeed the problem with why all this shit is coming out. Now, while these things are happening is because you're not dealing with 
grown adult professionals that are used to having women throw themselves at them for very little fucking effort whatsoever and also making big money and working every night so that they, you know, obviously have something to lose. And also just the fact of, of <laughs> being fucking grown up adults. It like, it's almost like these kids think they're still in fucking high school. So now instead of thousands of and women throwing themselves at stars, they're running these small shows and these training school shows, these independent shows where everybody pitches in and it's a family effort and somebody's running the merchandise stand and boy, she looks nice. And there's no women fans to speak of. If they if they're there, they came with their boyfriends reluctantly. So now these fucking guys are having to hit on the fucking ancillary promotion crew and or the trainees that want to be female wrestlers themselves and are hanging around trying to get experience. And there's nobody running the show to say, hey, don't be fucking doing that. And and, and then it's it, the, the vibe I get from a lot of these people's stories about the way the guys go on, it's like, they th when Joey Ryan said I've started leaving a leading a rock and roll lifestyle. Oh, blow me! Just blow me, blow me. Yes, it's sexual harassment. I'm still blow me, blow me. Living a rock and roll lifestyle at 37 years of age, making adjusted for fucking inflation, the same thing we were all making when we were in our early 20s in fucking Louisiana. You still have to be a fucking grown adult. Don't take advantage of people in that situation. But. There, it, it's like when we said the first time, the first David Von Erich Memorial event in Dallas, they had a match that needed a stadium. And then thereafter, they had a stadium that needed a match. They're trying to self-fulfill a lot of these guys themselves, the rock and roll lifestyle, but they don't have the fucking groupies for that part of it. So they're fucking bullying themselves on other people. And I've said before, and I don't care what anybody else says about me, I've never had to fucking twist anybody's arm or make anybody do anything they wanted to do or continue on over an entire night or multiple times of seeing somebody flirting and making fucking blah, blah, blah and requests and, oh, come on and just please. What the fuck? Begging to fucking, go back to the hotel room with them. Get Begging. a fucking hooker. Get a fucking hooker. And you don't, and then you get what you want, and then fucking an hour later, you don't have to speak to anybody. You fucking dipshits. What the fuck? It's, uh, it, it, it's, if I'd ever had to work that hard, it would be a fucking, not only a, a sign of personal failure, but also just demeaning. So that's what I'm seeing is that there was, it's all become community theater. It's all become, hey, kids, let's put on a show. Uh, these indie guys that suddenly got hot because of the internet and are now being flown around were being treated like it was Ernie Ladd coming into the fucking WWF to fucking fight Bruno in the garden after he just run had a run in Los Angeles. You know, uh, whatever the fuck. No, it's a fucking outlaw guy that got hot because of the internet. Don't treat him like a fucking star and have your fucking young girl helpers carting him around. Maintain control of your fucking business and, and try to tell the uh, fucking guys to goddamn search outside. That's why I couldn't believe all these guys, the couples that are getting together in the WWE, it was always discouraged for if there was a, a female member of the roster, which and it's another thing we'll talk about in a second, and she was unattached, Stay away from a relationship because that's the last thing he wants relationships in the locker room. Let the boys fuck around with the girls in the crowd and that keeps everything separate. Nobody gets smartened up. There's no fucking feelings. About, don't bring your wives and girlfriends around the matches because they'll see other guys whose friends, their wives and girlfriends are doing shit they don't want to do. be seeing done. See where I'm going with this? Keep fucking business and personal life separate in that respect. But now there's no girls in the audience for the guys, so they bring them into the fucking locker room. <clears throat> the, and, and for the, the supposed how everybody was so abusive in the 80s, 
I never saw any of the ladies on the fucking shows in the 80s being mistreated. Precious was with Jimmy Garvin. Everybody treated her like gold. And most of the ladies on the card were with one of the guys and was part of the gimmick. But even if they weren't baby doll, her father and mother were wrestlers, but she wasn't, but she was looked after as one of the boys. And except for it being mutual with her and Sam Houston, nobody fucking tried to bully baby doll or whatever the fuck, you know, that wouldn't been a good idea physically, but you see where I'm going with this on the concept. Um, the girls were taken care of because they were viewed by the boys as one of the boys and don't fucking fuck them around. You don't want to fuck up business. If you do have a relationship and it breaks up and we all, y'all are both still booked. If she's on the card better than you are, then you might be fucked. So just stay away from that. And when Moolah's girls would come in, they'd have their own car. Or if one of the girls was friends with one of the guys and wanted to make the loop with him. Well, okay, fine. And the other girls would ride by themselves or whatever. So if it was just one girl, I I remember one time in Tennessee, they brought Heather feather in to work a deal with the manager, Chuck Malone. She was like 350 pounds. He was 150. And Paul Morton was assigned to Heather feather, drive her around the time she was in the territory. So nobody'd bother her. She's a very sweet girl, but huge. And Paul Morton was 120 pounds. So that was even funnier looking when they drove up. But there was uh, no, and if, and, and for all the abuse Moolah took once again, and some of Moolah's girls that were accused of all this other bullshit, God damn. If you had tried to fuck with some of these girls, they'd break a bottle over your fucking head unless they were amenable to it. So I'm just without accusing everybody or jumping on everybody's misery. I wanted to take up for the eighties in general, as far as our generation was supposed to be so unsavory and abusive and vile and dirty and, and carny and whatever the fuck. And now they've all cleaned it up. What the fuck? I never saw any of this shit going on back then. So I, maybe it's just, it, it depends on, it's just like somebody else that now has a national television show that he's got to book without ever having done this shit before. They're going on the stories they've heard about the way it used to be because they weren't actually there and they've got a picture in their head of the way it used to be, but they never experienced it. So they've just heard stories and they can't fucking actually understand that it's not, it's not the way it used to be just the way you've decided it is so you can change it, take up for the fact that it ain't the way it used to be and it should be. If more people were happy with it that way. Did I hit on one of those dichotomies there, Brian? I think you did. So when Wendy Richter, for example, was sent to Mid-South Wrestling in 84 when you were there, none of the guys on the card pestered her into having sex and going back to her hotel room saying, please let me lay down for a while. Can I just <laughs> take a shower? None of these things happened. <laughs> well, I, and I would no, it did. They didn't. And I would love to say that, that Wendy went back to a palatial hotel room and, and had her, uh, you know, a fucking room service dinner. But she, I, as I recall, she did stay at the Alamo Plaza at Shreveport, uh, like all the rest of us did, but no, she had her own room and, uh, nobody wanted to take a shower at the Alamo Plaza in Shreveport, but uh, but no, it, it, that's what I'm saying. You know, you didn't do that. It was, it, they were one of the boys, unless they were a, a receptive, more than receptive to the fucking idea. I'm not saying that never happened, but no, all she would have had done would have been go back to Moolah and say, Hey, they're this fucking idiot in Watts's territory. So-and-so would not leave me alone. And then Moolah would call Watts and say, well, one of my girls wasn't happy. Because unless there was a prearranged arrangement, and I'm not saying that never happened, I'm not gr grouping Wendy in on this. If there was a prearranged arrangement between parties, I can't say that ever happened. But if one of the guys was being a pain in the ass to one of the girls that Moolah sent in, the girl would tell Moolah, and Moolah would turn around and would uh, call the office because she doesn't. she's not calling Bill Watts saying, fuck you, I'll never send you girls again. She's saying, hey, you got some fucking asshole on your fucking card, one of the heels, such, name such and such, what's his problem? You don't want that. 
Is it just <sighs> they made such a big deal out of wrestling being different, out of it being a generational thing, and the guys today and the girls today won't wouldn't put up with the behavior of the past. But you're finding out now where there's more women than have ever been involved in wrestling before around professional wrestling, that the guys, some of them, not everyone, but obviously some of them, we've heard a lot about them, are as creepy as any guys from previous generations, are as perverted as anyone you've heard about from previous generations, are just as drunk as wrestlers from the previous generation. You know, there haven't been any stories about cocaine. Trust me, there are guys who do just as much cocaine as they did in a previous generation. Not everyone's playing video games. Well, some of them may not be able to afford as much as the previous generation. That's true. Um, and there's much more. You've forgotten one thing. There is much more desperation. Desperation is the word that I use. Because there was no need for everybody in the 80s to be desperate to find somebody to fuck them. Because there were multiples for everybody willing and able. It's not our fault, speaking on behalf of the 80s generation, you young whippersnappers out there, although with the fucking size and the look and the state of some of these young whippersnappers, they're fucking wearing pigtails and flip-flops, it's not our fault you can't get laid on your own without just fucking badgering people to do it. You can't draw any women fans that are excited about seeing rock stars. You're drawing a bunch of guys that want to chant fight forever. Fuck you. I'd like to fight for a little while, get paid, and then go fuck a little. Instead of fighting forever. If you fight forever, you can't stop and fuck. What was that George Carlin routine? The fucking hotel should really be just called Hotel. And down at the bottom, the, the the light should flash, sleep, fuck, sleep, fuck. Because that's really all you do at the hotel. You sleep or you fuck. Hotel, sleep, fuck, sleep, fuck. Anyway, you know what? No. I'll tell you what. I've got a good way. I have got a good way for all those young ladies out there that are trying to get away from all these desperate men to get the jump on them and get away from them. The rad power bikes, we've been talking about, the, they go up to 20 miles an hour, and I've looked at some of these sorry sacks of shit physical specimens on some of the, uh, the independent rosters these days, and I believe, I don't think they can run 20 miles an hour, Brian, so I believe a rad power bike could outrun them. But the rad power bikes, we've, there's so many pluses and positives. It's an electric bike. You're not using gasoline. It's good for the environment. You don't need to fire up your car. If you just want to go a mile or two down the road, grab a, one of the kids from the playground, strap him on your back, drive him right back. You don't even have to pedal and you can go 20 what? miles an hour. What? what you grabbing kids from the playground? You got to pick the kid up from the playground, grab the, I'm not talking about somebody else's kids. I'm talking about your kids. Okay. You grab your kid from the playground. I think it's important no, it's, we specify it's, that. Yes. It's discouraged just grabbing random people's kids from the playgrounds. We don't uh, we don't in, endorse that at all. Uh but uh, you know, you get out in nature, you can go to the park and you can if you've got bad knees like I do, but you still get out in the fresh air, you know, riding one of these without having to pedal anyway. These rad power bikes cost about half as much as the other e-bikes out there on the market. As we said, you know, you can bop back and forth to the grocery, carry some kids, get out in the park. And to show appreciation for the people that serve us, Rad Power Bikes is offering $100 off all e-bike purchases for active or ex-military first responders, teachers, and students. And they've got dedicated U.S.-based customer support seven days a week to answer any questions or concerns that you may have. I know, Brian, you had all your questions answered. You have no concerns now, whatever. But if you know somebody that likes to be active, get out and about and, and not around other human beings and have the uh, transportation ability to get away from other human beings before they spread their viruses on them, then you, you got to get a rad power bike. And the way we can save you some money here on the program, if you text Jim, that's my name, Jim, wouldn't you know who won the pony? J I M to 64,000. That's 64,000. 64, 
and you buy a bike, you can get a free gift, an accessory of up to $100 in value, plus free shipping to, I love to say this word, the lower contiguous 48 states. And flexible financing as low as 0% APR unless you're a deadbeat hillbilly gypsy from somewhere off Cherokee Road in Louisville. They won't give you any credit. Uh, but anyway, Rad Power Bikes, folks, you need one. You got to have one. Get out and about. Get around the uh, the town. Out in the fresh air. That's is right. your air fresh in New Jersey, Brian? It is beautiful and fresh where I am, but I'm nowhere near the turnpike. <laughs> The turnpike smells like fucking the crotch of goddamn Happy Humphrey's fucking wrestling trunks. That's what I hear. Just every time oh, you've been on it, you know it. I'm talking, I, that's what I hear about Happy Humphrey. I've been on the turnpike. Oh, I will. <laughs> I haven't been on Happy Humphrey. I'd like you to know. <laughs> but Harley Race did vouch for that. And, oh, my God. You know, that's that's another reason why Harley Race was the toughest man in wrestling. When your first job is having to drive Happy Humphrey around and, and give him a shower in the back parking lot with a garden hose, you know you're a fucking tough man. That's right. Anyway, so you got some, we got some things to talk about around the world of wrestling. People are getting sick. There's things going on. You were going to bring up some, some things to me that we were going to react to. Well, there is some news around wrestling. Let's talk about one of the big stories that has broken overnight. Uh, obviously, we are recording on Friday, the 26th. Tessa Blanchard, no longer with Impact Wrestling. She was, I believe, their world's heavyweight champion. Well, and I must admit that you didn't prep me on all these. You, I said, just go through and pick out the headlines. But you did, right before we went on the air, you said, did you hear about Tessa Blanchard? And I said, oh, my God, what happened? Well, she's done with Impact. I'm like, oh, okay. So basically, as I said, what that means is she's not going to be allowed to come over and help out at a friend's lemonade stand on Sunday afternoons anymore. It's not like this is the end of life for Tessa, but she's done with impact. I'm assuming she didn't want to leave Mexico and go all the way to wherever the fuck it is. That, where are they taping these days? Are they doing, they're doing new programming with no people, right? I presume they are. I don't follow impact closely, but from what I gather... She wasn't asked to leave Mexico and go anywhere. She was asked to send in promos from Mexico <laughs> and then just decided not to do it. Well, in that case, I, it doesn't sound like that she was uh, entertaining the idea of wanting to be invited back, uh, does it? So, I, I mean, you know, like I said, I wouldn't want to go from Mexico to wherever they're taping in the middle of a pandemic. I wouldn't want to really be in Mexico to goddamn begin with. Just be quite perfectly honest with you during a pandemic. But, uh, you know, I guess they had to fire her if she's just, if she's not only not coming, but now she won't send the promos. Well, fuck it. Move on. She's a great worker. Um, I don't who's think. Who's going to hire her? Well, one would imagine that since her father is over on the other channel and she's one of the best female workers in the world, Charlotte Flair level, the last time that I saw her. Uh, maybe even better with some of the facials and shit. Uh, AEW wouldn't want to uh, actually have a legitimate women's division, or is this, is, does she have heat with somebody over there? Well, here's the thing. Yes, she's talented. She's one of the most talented female wrestlers out there. But AEW, again, the all-inclusive wrestling promotion, by all accounts, their female division all get along. Everyone, you know, they have no problems with that other than the booking. Well, no, well, no, they have no problems otherwise than the booking and the execution. That's right. I'm sure they all get along. They all can't grab their ass with either hand. Now, Tessa Blanchard has a little bit of a reputation for several things, including being difficult. And, of course, there was the issue where she was accused by several wrestlers, including, I think, a few that are aligned with AEW, of in the past using the N-word on a wrestler and various things that wouldn't really jive with an all-inclusive locker room or one where there isn't someone with Tully Blanchard heat amongst the <laughs> other workers in the division. Well, That's yeah, it. you know, okay, you just brought something up. Tully was not the most popular gregarious motherfucker in the locker room for Crockett either, but he was so fucking good and he drew money and fucking people put up with it. I don't give a fuck what they do with their women's division because I don't give a fuck what they do. 
But if they're serious about actually having a women's division and a professional wrestling co- company, and they want to get away from the Japanese schoolgirls or the just in parade of indie rific, poorly booked, green, inexperienced talent that they have paraded through under the guise of female wrestlers. If I was Tony Khan, I would fucking talk to Tessa Blanchard, and as long as she was willing to do business and didn't seem to be uh, causing any issues or trying to cause any issues with coming to a deal, I would then basically either bring her in, put the belt on her, and have all these other girls do a job on the way out and just fucking hide them somewhere and get me some women that could work with Tessa and start all over again. Or elsewise, I just wouldn't bring her in and just have to keep having the same green girls have the same shitty matches. It do, Like I said, it doesn't matter. But if they really wanted to do something, there they got a chance. But you hit on a couple of things there. One, I'm sure she would probably have a very nice conversation with Tony Khan, the same way that you said every time you've ever been around Tessa, she's been delightful to be around. And then it's the other women she works with who seem to have the problem. <laughs> but secondly, you just said you'd put the title on her and, and book the whole division around her. If she just refused to send in promos as the Impact World's Heavyweight Champion, not Women's Heavyweight Champion, the heavyweight champion of every division they have there, what does that say about reliability? How well, could you put another title on her right away? For one thing, it's Impact. You know, so but, I mean, really, you no, I, 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 I know yeah. I'm kidding. And oh, I'd be fucking hotter than a $2 pistol if it was OVW. Well, she wouldn't be my men's champion, but she might be my women's champion. Um, if it was just OVW local television or whatever the case, I'd be hot, except we don't know what went on on the other side. Cause there's, there's been some occasions where people have asked me for some fucking promos, but they didn't get them because they didn't come through with something on their side. I'm just saying all things being equal, Tully Blanchard is working in AEW. He obviously has had a, a, a relationship with Tony Khan now for some period of time, months, whatever. I think they could all sit down, and if Tony Khan was Bill Watts and commanded some respect, well, okay, I know I've already jumped the shark, he could sit down, he could say, you know what, I am willing because of your great talent and the Blanchard name in the business to do business with both of you guys, but this shit needs to work out. If you have any other idea of coming in here and doing anything else besides being the women's champion and leading the division and doing what's best for business as we all agree that that's what it is, then great, that's what I want to do. If not, I'll fire you, I'll fire your father, I'll hire somebody else from your family just so I can fire them too. And we're going to give you some fucking money and give you a national TV show, show what you can do. The son, or the son, the daughter of Ric Flair is over on the other channel. Prove to me you can be better. Challenge her, and then give her the spot to do it, and then bring in any girl in the business that is not under contract to the WWE that can have a legitimate athletic contest with Tessa Blanchard, wherever that may be. Don't do any of this intergender bullshit so everybody tunes out and goes, what the fuck, and you're left with the same kind of goddamn play wrestling fans you started with. Focus this girl that works like a fucking guy and has that game face and believable shit and out fucking Charlotte and Rhea Ripley, the other fucking channel. If you wanted to establish a women's division, you could do that. Or you could keep letting a bunch of goddamn pampered, inexperienced, indie-rific outlaw guys recommend their fucking girlfriends and goddamn significant others and trainees and people that they saw on a fucking rec center show and it popped them in front of 100 people. And that's the kind of girls' matches you've got right now. What about if the entire women's ride? And I know you don't give a shit about the women's division, and I haven't been a big fan of it. There is some talent there, but by and large, I'm not a fan of it in AEW. But what if that entire locker room comes to Tony Khan and says, we refuse to work with her? Okay, see ya. None of you men. There's not a girl there that makes a goddamn difference in anything. They've booked them all to be equal and equally obscure. There was potential in Britt Baker, and as a heel still, yes. As a heel, yes, but she's in a wheelchair. Thanks to one of their other fucking projects, green projects. 
So Britt Baker's a great personality. And and as a matter of fact, if Tessa Blanchard was a badass heel fucking dominant physical champion, Britt Baker could be like a Tully Gino kind of thing where Britt Baker was the really over-the-top flamboyant fucking heel. Um, yeah, she'd work. Nyla Rose, send her away for a while, teach her a new hold, rehab, or whatever the fuck. When she comes back, maybe they'll forget how she bumped for every fucking 90 pound girl in the in the business. Um, but no, bring in some new names, don't fuck it up this time. And if they don't want to fucking do a job for Tessa, and then they can just fuck it. Do you need help carrying your bag to the car? What the fuck? But what new names? I mean, you would think if there were many Are other there great women names. in the world, we are talking, once again, we're talking about a billionaire in a national television show. I'm not talking about what they're going to do. I'm talking about what they ought to do. Is there any other female talent besides those under contract to the WWE anywhere in the world that can have good quality athletic contest matches like, as I mentioned, the Charlottes and the Rhea Ripley's of the world did at WrestleMania with Tessa Blanchard? If there are... You ought to be able to have the money to get them. If there aren't, just shut the fucking thing down and we won't have to watch outlaw bad girl wrestling on Wednesday nights. It's a, And I don't care which you do, but I'm just telling you this is what you should do if, if, if you want to have a women's division. That's what I would do if I was a billionaire. Moving on. Well, also, uh, as we are recording, this just broke a little while ago. I guess Impact is also separating from Michael Elgin. Okay, what did he do now? I'm actually not exactly sure. <laughs> Probably nobody else is either at this point. But when they let go of Joey Ryan and uh, some other guy I hadn't heard of before, they said Michael Elgin was suspended pending investigation. And then they just were announced today, this morning, that he will not be brought back. Apparently the investigation didn't turn out well. Um... I never had any problems with Michael Elgin. Michael Elgin's problems began in Ring of Honor after I left. Imagine that. Um, I, we liked him. What a fucking strong guy. Powerhouse. He got hot. We talked about how he got real hot in Ring of Honor after that match with Davey Richards, WrestleMania weekend 2012 in Florida, Fort Lauderdale. And we also mentioned if you that's one of those matches, if you go back the first 10 minutes is any indie match ever, and then they both came off top rope and almost killed themselves, and it woke everybody up, including them, and they did 10 goddamn five-star minutes and tore the house down. And it became, you know, uh, Michael Elgin should be the next world champion, which we couldn't put the belt on him because he was he had no working papers in America. We did, I didn't even find this out until we'd already been booking him. I thought he was from Detroit. He was just riding over with Truth Martini and those guys. He was driving from Toronto to Detroit and then riding in a car with them. I'm like, fuck. And then we couldn't get Sinclair to pay for it. Blah, blah, blah. But anyway, the only thing I can tell you about Michael is just that I think he took, he, he took the feedback he got off that match seriously. I heard after I left Ring of Honor, I, then I heard he was, you know, just he would get in his own way, he'd make goofy comments like they did the ballpark show in New York. And he was out there and he was hitting balls and hit a big home run. So he wanted to try out to be a, a major league baseball player. He was going to leave wrestling behind. And he got the big head from what I heard and had some heat in the locker room. But I don't I don't know anything about Michael Elgin that would. Make me understand why that he's done now, too. But I didn't know about some of these other people as well. So there you go. Yeah, I guess there are stories out there about behavior with women. I don't know specifics, so I can't speak to it. Well, I have I feel bad for Unbreakable. Well, the other big story is that after insisting on continuing with their live television shows, doing tapings, inviting friends and family in, reportedly telling them not to wear face masks <laughs> while on camera, WWE, and we don't know the lengths of it at this point, has had a COVID-19 outbreak amongst talent and crew. The notable names I saw this week were Adam Pierce, who of course is and, a producer for them, and Renee well, and, by, and by the way, by the way, get well, Adam, soon. Uh, I loved my time working with Adam Pierce in Ring of Honor. He's a great guy. 
Well, hopefully he'll be able to stay out long enough to see some of the baseball season and then come back. <laughs> yeah, and he's a baseball fan. He's <laughs> right. too. So there you go. But the other one, which was interesting, was Renee Young, who is a commentator there. And because she caught COVID-19, the coronavirus, John Moxley was not on AEW. He told them that he has had contact, obviously, with his wife, who he lives with. So now he has to self-quarantine for a period of time. But apparently the amount of people who are sick reportedly goes far beyond that. Well, I heard uh, about 20 people, give or take uh, or more, uh, by the time that they factor everything in that they knew at that point. And here, the th of course, they uh, there was controversy over, did they say don't wear masks? Kevin Dunn was attributed with the line, if, you, if you're going to wear masks, you're not a wrestling fan or whatever. But then people said they didn't say that. There was controversy about who the friends and family were. Were they just fans or were they friends and family? I'm, I'm sure they're somebody's friends and family. Of those people that were in there, they uh, all of them have at least one friend, and I'm sure they were not created in a test tubes. They have some, the question is, whose friends and family were they? But what the... F the whole reason why that nobody's wearing a mask on WWF TV, WWE TV is because Vince has the same mindset as President Pig shit. Mask is a sign of weakness. Don't wear a mask. Uh, if, if we don't wear a mask, people will forget about it. He's forgetting that there's one thing. The wrestling audience has changed. The redneck right-wing Republican that used to be the classic pro wrestling audience member has fucking left the building because the redneck right wing Republicans were insulted by the phony, silly play wrestling that was going on in place of the blood and guts they used to like to watch. So now Vince is still trying to play to the stereotype of the wrestling fan that he remembers, which it is more the Democrat, liberal, I'm going to fucking get my feelings hurt and whine and cry about everything type. Now, I never said that I was going to take up for all the Democrats as, as well as knock all the Republicans. I've admitted that there are stupid Democrats and crazy Democrats, the whining and offensive type. They get offended all the time. We need to use those for the greater good of the overall sane people. However, if they'd have had all those fucking people wearing masks and called attention to the fact that we've got selected friends, fans, family, whatever they wanted to call them in, and we're all being safe, we're all wearing masks, they would have got positive publicity. Would they not have the WWE? It would have been, oh, how great that they did this. Instead, they not only don't get any positive publicity, they get some negative publicity, and there's a bunch of people getting sick. Whether it was from this or not, who knows? But they're going in and out of the fucking Orlando airport, which is now one of the big hotspots. And they're out amongst public. Why the, the fucking baseball players are still trying to figure out how to play, what, half or a third of the season in a select location where they can all be taken care of. And Vince wants these guys to trot down to a fucking hotspot airport, what, every week or two to tape all this shit and back and forth. You know, I'm a major baseball fan and I've really missed it. It's been weird for me to go through this time of year and not have the Mets on every day. I really want to watch baseball. I am deathly afraid that baseball is going to shut down once they restart because you can't control this virus. And we already saw players in spring training camps go down with it, or I guess it's not even technically spring training, but just training camps go down with it. And that's baseball. That's something where they're going to try to distance as much as possible, although you can only take that so far. This goes back to the argument, WWE should have shut down. AEW should have shut down too, probably, but WWE should have shut down. And also, think about how this started. All of a sudden, WWE got an exemption from the state of Florida that they were an essential business, and that was just so they could do these shows. Let's see what the tally is at the end of the day of how many wrestlers, how many commentators, how many crew get sick. But this is all on Vince. This is just pure stupidity, the way they've handled... You can't even say COVID-19 or coronavirus on their television show. It's in an alternate universe. 
But if all the wrestlers start getting sick, then what do you do? Well, and that's and that's Vince has his banned words and his things he doesn't want to talk about, and so does Trump. And of course, you know, Florida is a big Trump state, and Linda donated the money to the Trump campaign or the mayor's camp or governor's campaign in Florida, or whatever. Yeah, we know how it happened, but the point is they didn't even have to start letting people in the building and opening up their social circle and or, as I said, not having everybody wear masks so at least there can be a defense where we've looked like we've done everything we could. In this case, apparently, AEW has been doing the real tests since the start, whereas fucking Vince was having them take everybody's temperature until shit got more strenuous. So it's just, it's just, I can understand why AEW didn't shut down. And they just started testing, by the way. They just, WWE just started testing, and these are the results. Yeah. Up up to 20 people so far could have it. How many people have had it that weren't tested because WWE ignored that for a couple months? Well, and, and, well, hopefully all those people have already recovered and didn't fucking go out and spread it around, but. I can see why AEW didn't shut down. They had no library. And I liked the, they were better served by the small, intimate, you know, kind of wonky atmosphere of of QT Marshalls and some of the boys in the audience and everything. Or even now, you know, the, the outdoor amphitheater, it does, it sounds better. They have more people, but it's also outdoors and they can spread out. WWE was really hurt first. They, it shot themselves in the foot because that completely sterile, quiet, and all lit up environment that they first went with was just abysmal. And then they downscaled that a bit, but still it was so quiet and sterile and just homogenized. And they've never really found a good atmosphere that works for them because AEW can, it looks okay, kind of grungy, because they are obviously second place as far as budget and you know big league and it was different it kind of worked for them wwe has just they should i think they should have just been running the fucking library because they've got 40 years of fucking wrestling they should have just been running the library for the last three months that the ratings couldn't have been much worse on the old shows that everybody could have stayed home and stayed healthy and by the way you brought up qt marshall before Originally, this week's AEW Dynamite, it was FTR versus the Natural Nightmares, Dustin Rhodes and QT Marshall. That match was changed because QT Marshall had exposure to coronavirus. So, But it ended up actually, and I, I love you, QT, out there, but it ended up being a, a positive change. No, but my point we'll is just, in a few minutes. you but can yes, take all but the precautions well, you want, it's still there, it's still around. It's spreading faster than ever before in Florida right now because the governor ignored reality for a good period of time, this isn't going away quickly. No. <laughs> We've been, this country's been ignoring reality for the past three and a half years. That's what the fucking problem is. Now reality is coming back to smack us. Mm. Anyway. And that's the wrestling news. You know what? I'll tell you what, though. They everybody that I've heard, and this is very serious. This is not just a slick segue, but it's very serious. Everybody that I have heard talk about this say that the best way, besides wearing a mask and avoiding social contact, that you can prepare yourself for COVID-19 and in, improve your chances is by keeping a strong immune system. Yes. And folks, our friends at Athletic Greens can help you with that. Athletic Greens, the all-in-one daily drink to support better health and peak performance. You always want your performance to, to be peak, Brian. But this stuff is developed from a complex blend of 75 vitamins, minerals, and whole food sourced ingredients. It's better than Vitamita Vegemin. It's a greens powder engineered to help fill the nutritional gaps in your diet, and it addresses the four pillars of health, energy, recovery, gut health, and immune support. It's packed with adaptogens. I didn't even know that there were adaptogens until we started drinking Athletic Greens, but they help with recovery. There's probiotics and digestive enzymes for gut health, vitamin C and zinc citrate for immune support, less than one gram of sugar, but it takes great, takes, takes, tastes great. It tastes great. Yes. Whether you eat keto, paleo, 
vegan, dairy flea, fl- dairy flea, dairy gluten, flea. gluten flea, <laughs> <laughs> a series of small strokes. I've never eaten any of these ways. Keto, paleo, vegan, dairy free or gluten free. I've never done any of that. But if you do, it still works because there's none of that bad shit in it. Anyway, Athletic Greens, basically, you know the drill because Brian always talks about not having to juice the vegetables and blend everything up and clean up afterwards. You just take a scoop of this and pop it in the daggum water and stir it up, and there you go. It's It's even better than vitamins because with a vitamin, they take many of the similar ingredients from Athletic Greens, and they heat it up to make it into that little capsule, and that takes away some of the nutritional benefits of said vitamins. This is in the raw. In the raw. That's right. Well, we all love things in the raw, folks. But anyway, there's no harmful chemicals, no GMOs, no funny additives. Continuing, continuing, they continue to improve this athletic greens until it's as state-of-the-art as it can be. It is actually NSF certified for sport. NSF certified. Anyway, folks, go to athleticgreens.com slash JCE. To claim your special offer, thanks to us, of 20 free daily travel packs with your first purchase. That's a $79 value added. 20 free daily travel packs with your first purchase at athleticgreens.com slash JCE. Invest in your health today. It's a good investment. That's right. For everyone who says, I want to get healthier, this is a good investment for your health. Well, put your money where your mouth is and put your... Your athletic greens where your mouth is too and drink them down and you'll feel much better. We 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 didn't go back on our word. Uh, hold on, let me get rid of that. There we go. We didn't get back on our word. Go back on our word. What's the matter with you giggling again like well, I don't a know what just happened over there. I just tossed it away. Uh we didn't go back on our word. We are not watching this fucking cosplay clown show that they call wrestling on Wednesday nights because it just, it hurt my feelings. People were getting, here's that we've had a lot of people say, Oh, please watch all elite wrestling again, Jim Cornette, because we wouldn't watch it. We would wait for you to review it. And then we'd watch it with your review because that's the only way we could stand it. But now it's no fun for us. Well, it wasn't for any fun for me to begin with. So, but I have said that we will do one of two things. We will watch any time that MJF is involved or any time FTR is involved. It's amazing. All of our favorite talents have initials now. And that's what we did. We, we picked and chose our content from AEW this week based on those two individual or two pieces of talent, a tag team and a single, and that's what we've got here this week. Is that correct? You, If you watched any of the rest of it, I don't care because I don't want to hear about it, and I didn't. That is correct. I did indeed watch the rest of it, and like you said earlier, we've heard from a pretty amazing amount of people who say that they stopped watching because they were only watching because it helped them enjoy your review of the AEW show. It should be the other way around. (laughs) The the TV show was an accompaniment to my review. (laughs) Well, let's get to the two main bones of contention this week. Uh, This was June 24th. It aired for AEW Wrestling. Well, I'm interested to hear what you actually watched because AEW this week, they started off with the Lumberjack match, Wardlow versus Luchasaurus. You said you watched two segments I think that was the only segment with MJF. Is that what you watched? Well, therein lies the problem. Here comes MJF, so I'm going to watch. And MJF did nothing. <sighs> the The idea. See, I know, I know what they were. T- I assume Tony Khan really is booking this because nobody else would have done this. That knew what they were doing. And I know the ideas by somebody like I've read articles on, you know, medical procedures. That means that I know the words, but I don't know how to do them or when they are really called for. Last week or whenever they had the big schmas with all the people with these guys. So now they then the Wardlow and Luchasaurus, the two big guys, they were in the middle of it. So now they're going to have a lumberjack match with Wardlow versus Luchasaurus so that they can have a schmoz and book a tag team match for their big fighter fest. 
All this is booking 101. Exactly. It's booking 101. You're just coming up with shit that you've heard on shoot interviews is the reason to have matches. And then you do it that way. This was the exact worst match to have on free TV or to start this fucking thing out. Well, I don't mean start it, but continue it. The first time that the two guys meet is on free television. The two big monsters. The first time they meet is in a single match on free television. They don't know what they're fucking doing. This is like putting a hat on a hat. We're going to, we're not only going to give you away the match between the two giants, we're going to put it on free TV and give it away. We're also going to make it a lumberjack match, a stipulation that wasn't fucking needed and that nobody knew how to fucking work. And besides that, we're going to kill the program because if we'd have started with the tag match, Luchasaurus and Jungle Boy against Wardlow and MJF, then you have two guys that could have worked the fucking match and made the big men special and limited their spots. Heat on Jungle Boy, come back Luchasaurus. MJF and fucking Jungle Boy are the actual workers and athletes. Wardlow's indestructible. He shouldn't be bumping except a couple of times so he can be do dominant against Jungle Boy. MJF can take bumps, but he can keep the heat because he's got the backup. There's all kinds of ways you could do it. But when you... <laughs> When you start out with this match, these guys are the shits. Wardlow's the shits because he's green, but he's huge and he looks great and he's got a ton of potential. Luchasaurus is the shits because apparently it, it, he may not be green anymore. He may just, we may have to settle for the fact that he's just awkward in the shits, but he looks great and he can do some stuff. So you hide this. You give them the tag. You tease the big men getting involved. There's no dominant big man one over the other. Both get their spots in. And then you advertise the goddamn showdown out of the tag match between the big men on something they have to pay for. And then you keep that short because it's going to end up being just like this match. And this was a rotten fucking match. And it was gonna be rotten there it's not even the guy's fault this was going to be rotten because it's not a good matchup so you keep it short keep it special and keep the big bombs coming they did some sloppy big man stuff luchasaurus cannot hit the ropes or the turnbuckles anybody wants to go back and watch this match now watch him get shot into a turnbuckle watch him run and hit the ropes um the Lumberjacks at first didn't try to toss anybody back in. And then the heels got some heat on the baby face at one time, but it, it, here the, th they all just didn't know what to do. And they were fan. It's by the way, the highest paid outlaw talent in the world was surrounding the ring. Some of these guys couldn't buy a television and definitely shouldn't have been on it six months ago. And now they're on national TV on contracts and look at the state of them. <clears throat> um, I wrote, yeah, now that the fans have seen this, they'll never want to see it again. That's the old fucking, hey, who do I want on my roster? Arn Anderson or Sid Vicious in 90s WCW? Arn Anderson, draw you steady money for a long period of time. People never get tired of watching it. Sid Vicious will draw you $15 million in one night on pay-per-view, and they probably won't ever want to see it again. Um... Luchasaurus has come back as those awkward kicks delivered with no fire because instead of working like a big guy, he wants to flip around like a fucking gymnast. There was no life to this match. There were sloppy moves back and forth. They buried Wardlow's invincible aura that he and MJF have built up. Both guys are the same size, which means they both look normal. Wardlow did do a great power slam on the ramp. I don't know how that might have felt to old Luchasaurus. But finally, the Lumberjacks get in a fucking schmoz. Luchasaurus and Wardlow have a sloppy fight moving across the stage to their stage predetermined position. Then Wardlow throws, I think it was Wardlow, one of the, one of the regular sized guys got thrown off the stage into the crowd. 
Um, but then Wardlow picked stunted growth up and threw him. So they should have kept it to that one because they, our guy had already gone off the stage. Then here goes fucking Marco stunted growth, but he flies farther. Then they caught him. Then Wardlow gets kicked off the stage and everybody caught him. And then everybody gathered around at Luchasaurus. If they had just been having this fight and punching each other in the face and it, they're so mad at each other. And Luchasaurus kicks Wardlow off the fucking stage into a group of other people. Then if he was so fucking mad, he wants to get a hold of him. I can maybe see running and jumping off the stage and tackling the fucking guy. But instead, he went to the edge of the stage like he was in a swimming pool and fucking turned around and did a backflip off the stage just to show that he's a big, goofy-looking, tattooed fuck, but he can do a backflip onto the entire group of people indiscriminately because he couldn't even see where the guy he was fighting was. So it, there was no element of legitimacy of I'm in a fight. I'm really mad at this guy. No, but I'm going to show everybody I can do a fucking backflip. Now we know why the dinosaurs are extinct because they had fucking million dollar bodies and 10 cent brains. They're fucking huge, but their brains the size of a walnut and it doesn't fucking power their giant body to do smart, sensible things. So this match was the same indie garbage that they all do. And then the finish is a referee distraction and a nut shot and Wardlow's finish, one, two, three. It hurt both guys. It was fucking rotten. Then all everybody got in a big brawl, and Luchasaurus and Wardlow looked even more amateurish than they did during the match. And Tony Khan, within 10 seconds, had sent word that he announced that they signed a tag team match for their fighter fest, which is what should have been here to begin with, MJF and Wardlow against Luchasaurus and Jungle Boy. This is, this is what happens when fans congregate on the internet and write, instead of, you've heard of fan fiction, fan booking. They have a knowledge that somewhere that these things are done where you have the fight and then you book a lumberjack match. So nobody get away, but that really didn't work in. And then you bring it to, I don't know what the fuck they're thinking a thought process, but they don't understand that it's more than just stipulations to shit. You've got to have the right stipulation for the right guy and the right match that they can perform. That makes people want to see more, not less. This was not it. What'd you think? I was like you curious why this was a lumberjack match beyond everything else i don't know if at the height of the coronavirus we should be having lumberjacks next to each other at ringside well they're very hardy people they work outside a lot and they've got strong immune systems there was one guy i don't even know who he was he had the long flowing hair i thought it was jungle boy no jungle boy was standing next to him there's another guy <laughs> who just like jungle boy but bigger i was like that, why would they do that why would they have this guy at ringside with the jungle boy look I think Wardlow has a ton of potential. I wouldn't be using him the way they're using him. I don't think there was a promo from MJF on the rest of the show. That's a mistake with the way they use MJF. I was going to ask. I did fast forward trying to find him, and I was not successful. So I was hoping I didn't miss anything. If there was one, I missed it too, but I didn't see one. But I agree with you about all of a sudden in the midst of all this, like you can make an argument, and I'm not making the argument, but you could make an argument. <laughs> For Marco's stunt, getting up and running as fast as he can across the stage to dive on everyone. The Luchasaurus backflip, <laughs> he couldn't do it quickly. So he had to, like, you know, gather his, <laughs> his thought process, get ready. Everyone's standing there waiting. It's in the midst of a brawl. It's in the midst of a lumberjack match. To me, that's part of the problem. It's just, let's do spectacular spots for no reason. Let's just do it because I can do it. And now's the time because there are all these people here and they have a reason to catch me. <laughs> I got news for you. If I ever see a fucking 300 pound guy flying off a fucking 12 foot fucking precipice at me, I'm not going to be there when he lands. And like fucking you, I thought it was just backwards doing this to build to the tag team match. You would think you'd do the tag team match to build towards the big, they're finally one on one, a lumberjack match where you could just do it one on one. A match in a wrestling ring, <laughs> Wardlow and Luchasaurus 
what could happen. That tag team match could barely contain these two. What will happen one-on-one, but we're going backwards here. Yeah, but just remember, Dino, just because you can cut your own ear off doesn't make you Van Gogh. And I am pleased to announce that the other segment that I watched on this program, once again, a wrestling match broke out in the middle of a sea of insanity. FTR is now not only 2-0 and for their record in AEW, but is also 2-0 and for their record in actually having good matches that make sense. Imagine that. Uh, and it, by the way, they show their record FTR's record better stay whatever and O for quite some time, or I'm going to completely give up because they, they can't get talent on this level on a regular basis. Just every, every week or two, they better try to take care from now on of what they get because they've pretty much buried what they've gotten so far. Um, but this, it, it, and I was excited to see this because I've been a fan of Frankie Kazarian and Chris Daniels, and I've said this ever since this television show's been on the air. I don't like their Sergeant Pepper outfits and their fucking catchphrases and all the silly entertaining stuff that they have had added to them. But they're two of the best workers in the ring in the business, and I was excited to see this, and I was not disappointed because I've not actually seen. I don't, maybe I have, or maybe it was just, we were grading on the curve and it just didn't seem so bad, but have we seen a good Kazarian and Daniels match? Is this the only company in history that Kazarian and Daniels have worked in for any length of time? And we haven't really seen a good one because it's the, their opposition. We've seen good Kazarian and Scorpio sky matches. That's I think true. this was easily the best Chris Daniels yep. has looked in AEW by far. Well, and it's uh, and I'm not now. Everybody's going to be out there saying now Cornette saying FTR carries everybody. No, it's just in this Kazarian and Daniels actually got a chance to show what they can do, because if you're a world class ping pong player, and you're playing another world class ping pong player, that ping pong looks pretty fucking impressive. But if you're a world class ping pong player and you're playing a game against your drunk cousin's fucking girlfriend it's still the shits because you got nobody to work with so this instantly this was at another level in the ring from the time the bell rang timing work body language movement execution they start out wrestling they built to the tempers flare and this was the best part of that a break spot and you know every break spot is oh a big dive oh my gosh and they're laying there They actually made a break spot work. It can be done. They wrestled. The tempers flared. They got in a fucking double hockey fight, a pier six brawl. Then they both took separate but logical and different big bumps to the floor on either side, and all four guys are down. And now we go to the break, a break spot that actually worked. Oh, shit, what's what's happening? Ah, I want to see more of this. Not, oh, shit, that came out of nowhere, and now everybody's laying there again. So they got that right. Uh, Came back. They were already in action. They're getting... uh, Here's the thing. AEW's entire babyface and heel dynamic roster is completely fucked up. And you do not know at first sight, at first glance, you don't know instantly, you don't know naturally who the babyface and heels are. So now they go in a goddamn situation where they're actually SCU is getting heat on FTR, which is, they can all do this and FTR worked his face and they can all sell and they can all be heels and et cetera. But here's another thing. If they started now by the end of the year, they may have been able to rectify. They've had nine months on television and they've blown it. If they started now, which they won't, and they did it right, which they can't, then by the end of the year, we could know definitively who a heel and a baby face is, everybody on the roster. But they'd have to have somebody show them, and they ain't got that. So b- overlooking the fact that FTR are working as baby faces. Finally, Cash gets a fucking hot tag to Dash, and that was nice too, and da- uh, Dash, Cash, Dax. Dax makes great comeback. Everything was sharp right there, no wasted motion. Threw in the slingshot suplex, the homage to Tully Blanchard. 
Then they go into their back and forth, and they do some double team stuff. Everything was in place. I wasn't a fan of the double knockout and then the second simultaneous tag. I was not a fan of that particular spot in there. I thought it brought it down a little bit. But once again, all these guys know what they're doing. And Frankie and Daniels just hadn't had the chance to do it with anybody because nobody else could go with them. Um, I love the way they foiled SU's double team into the Vegematic. Of course, um, I might have to... I might have to write down some notes and send them to FTR on the Vegematic because there was a couple little small things nobody else would have noticed, but the camera shot, they shot the Vegematic from above. That's the only angle it doesn't look good from. Then they get a, a great reversal of their superplex splash double team, so it go more back and forth. Everybody's still there. Nobody fucked up. Good twists and turns. And then finally, right as they're going, this was music, actually. This was visual music. Immediately, right as they they float, they do another move and float right into where Dax has a headlock on Daniels, and right as Daniels backs him up to shoot him off, and they're floating into this anyway, just so smooth. There was a blind tag by Cash and Dax. If you will notice... Some people would think that it was a back slap tag, but it was a bad camera angle. But if you notice, as soon as Dax grabs the headlock on Daniels and Daniels backs him up to shoot him off, this is the way it's supposed to be done, and they did it perfectly. When you back a guy up to shoot him off, his right arm goes over the top rope and his hand rests on the top, right, Brian? You see that constantly. That's the way you keep the rope from going over the back of your head. Yeah. Right there is where the partner on the apron slaps the hand. Boom. When the hand is still so they don't miss, the hand's on the top rope. Boom. He slapped it. Daniel shoots Dax off. Cash is the legal guy. Watch it in slow motion, and you'll see it. And they do the duck, boom, and into the Goodnight Express. One, two, three. They went all the way through this, and I didn't see any fuck-ups. Once again, a brilliant in-ring performance. A, a, a team got over. The team that lost still looked better than they ever have in losing because they actually had great opposition. And it was, this is what, if you get talent, they can do. And the whole thing made sense. Nothing was insulting. Nothing was stupid or silly. Nobody was winking anybody. Nobody stood around waiting to cooperate and catch people. It's what it's supposed to be. They've just, they're not used to seeing it. So maybe they don't recognize it before we get to the afterbirth. What, uh, what was your thoughts on the match? Like I said before, best thing I've seen Christopher Daniels in an AEW thought it was great. Two for two, two excellent tag team matches. I think that the more AEW fans see of FTR, the more it becomes obvious. These guys are the best tag team in wrestling by far. They are so smart in a ring. They're so smart at putting together a match. They know what to do. They always know where they are. They just, they're great. I, I can't rave enough about them. And it's not just because they were on the Jim Cornette experience. I've always felt this way. <laughs> the reason why they were on the Jim Cornette experience is because we rave about them, not the other way around. No, and, and you know, this is one of those things I'll say that's good about AEW. The handcuffs are off. In WWE, there's a lot more strict in terms of what they could do, how long they can go, what they have to do, how they have to wrestle. We're now getting to see these guys with the handcuffs off, and you're seeing just how good they are. And I think a lot of AEW fans, I've heard it from a few people, actually, a lot of AEW fans who, you know, would always say the Young Bucks are better, they're now seeing FTR and really watching them for the first time, and they're realizing, no, this is, this is how you have tag team matches. This is a tag team. These guys are so good. But then there's the afterbirth. Well, and there you go. And here's where the, and, and I will make one more statement. Yes, they're having great matches, but is this where it comes to an end? SCU is far and away the best in-ring tag team in AEW. <laughs> so how can they top this match with, you know, FTR top this match by with a lesser tag teams? We shall see. Possibly some people can learn to keep their ears open. However. 
I was excited about the promo here. Not only they won that match, but then they'd get to do a promo and Dax's cardio must be fucking hellacious. After that match, he still did a nice wrestling promo calling out some tag teams and wanting to fight some people. Imagine that. That part was great. And then here we fall back to the amateur at Tony Khan's amateur hour again. Butcher and Blade are suddenly in FTR's truck. The new top heel team or top team has just won their second match on television and a preliminary undercard team has stolen or commandeered their shit. I wrote, they've fucked this up already. And while they're mocking FTR because they've stolen their truck, the Lucha Brothers show up in the ring behind FTR. This is the worst thing that could possibly happen because the Lucha Brothers are the preeminent tag team in Lucha Libre wrestling, and they are at American Wrestling, the drizzling fucking shits, and I don't, I can't contemplate how the fuck FTR could have a match with the Lucha Brothers at any point ever and it still, and it not suck because the Lucha Brothers can't do American style and FTR should not be doing Lucha. So there's that. Then the Lucha Brothers beat up FTR and the Young Bucks save them while the other mid-card underneath heels steal FTR's truck. Well, here we go. It was a nice ride while it lasted. It's all downhill from here. I wrote, after three weeks, FTR are another tag team on the card, participating in stupid angles with mid-card tag teams. And hold on, it says Washington, D.C. One second. I'm voting for Biden. Trump can go suck me. There we go. That's all you need to know, Washington. Anyway, so... <sighs> the fuck? They, they can't help shooting themselves in the foot. They can't help fucking up every potential quality piece of talent they get a hold of. They ca I don't... <laughs> FTR's career after this angle, in my opinion can be saved only by them going into business for themselves and potentially double-crossing somebody to get in a position where nobody can fuck with them and they can do whatever they want. Otherwise, if, the, if they, if, if anybody from this booking team tells FTR that they're going to be wrestling at night so they should get a flashlight, I wouldn't even do that. I would not do a goddamn thing. I wouldn't eat if I was hungry if this creative brain trust told me to, because they have fucked everything up about every new potential intriguing or money-drawing talent that they could present so far, they have fucking dropped the fucking ball and shit the bed. Stole their truck, and the Young Bucks saved them from an ass-kicking, from a fucking preliminary team and somebody that they will never be able to have a fucking match with worth a shit. I do think it's interesting that when the Butcher and the Blade wrestle, the one guy has the monocle, the other guy takes off the mask. They have kind of a demonic look. But when they're out of the ring, they've raided the wardrobe of Vic Tabak. <laughs> I'm not sure what they're going for with that, exactly. Kiss my grits, That's Butcher right. and Blade. See, now everybody's going to be Googling that. They're like, how do they know these things? FTR's matches have been fantastic. The way they've been booked is not the way I would have done it. Although, you know, I, with my great success with my G.I. Joe Wrestling Federation, beyond that, I really don't have too much booking experience. But Well, it wouldn't have been the way that I would have done it either, and I've had actual booking experience and success. Let me and ask you no. one question for you. Obviously, I'm assuming that you feel like I, that you wouldn't have booked the interactions with the Young Bucks and FTR the way they have been booked by Tony Khan so far. But is there an argument to be made that you had to do something a little out of the box because there are no fans there? You don't want to waste this match that everyone's been waiting for? 
Well, um, no, you don't know why. There's fans or no fans, empty arenas, fucking, you know, meteor showers, whatever. No, they shouldn't have had the match yet. But they should have been making us want to see it more. FTR should come in and do what they're doing now is, as far as bell to bell beat every fucking tag team in the territory in the in the company except the young bucks and finally beat Adam Page and Kenny Olivier and win the belts and then the bucks have to fucking take control back of AEW their company their project from these rogue renegades that ain't doing business with people. And I would, I would have even put in a fucking working double cross. Maybe, you know, somebody like the Lucha brothers, you want to keep a little fucking, you will give them an out, right? Fucking let FTR fucking double cross. Maybe they were supposed to do the job, but they did a double cross, whatever the fuck for a nod to the smart fans out there. But the point is no undefeated, get the belts young bucks. The only one can save the company and they don't do it the first time. That could take months if you did it right, but to just, and, and uh, keep FTR as outsiders, keep them. Uh, we don't care about any of these tag teams. So even, even yes, they are, they would still be heels and they would wrestle exclusively at heels. You make the other teams adapt for them. If they wrestle another fucking heel team, that heel team becomes the baby faces, but they work it like that. They work it like that. Instead of just everybody just doing shit to each other for no reason and who's cheating and who's not, we don't know. Build the fucking team, give them plenty of time to talk, give them plenty of wins, and then get them some heat. And and just a raw fuck or a dastardly fucking beat down of an angle that they could believe. Make those little pricks cough up some fucking blood. And then the people want to see the fucking match. And, and make sure through the whole thing that FTR is unsavory as possible, as insulting of the company, as plain spoken as possible, that they don't want to have anything to do with the rest of these jack off outlaw cosplay bastards. They just came in to prove a point, And then they're going to fucking use that for leverage to go back and prove some points where they weren't able to before. Look down on the fucking company and the fans of it and everybody in it with disdain. Be outsiders. Be separate. Dress in a different locker room. Don't play ball with the kids. That's the image they ought to have. And they ought to go out there and fuck up the ass anybody gets in their way. God damn. Real life writes this shit and they can't even fucking do it. Here they are again. I'm fixed to toss this phone in a second. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute. Now it's 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 the health council from Washington, D.C., same area code. Hold on a second. I'm healthy. There we go. That's for the health council. Okay, well, Jim, did you hear about the ratings this week? I did not hear about the ratings this week. AEW has, I believe every single week, I could check right here, has won in the ratings over NXT. It's been close a few times, but they I think they've been keeping a a lead. And especially in the key demos obviously. AEW had a big boost for that Mike Tyson episode, which is May 27th, so about a month ago. This past week's show, this past Wednesday night, whose number do you want first, NXT or AEW's? Uh give me uh give me AEW. They usually do somewhere around 600,000, right? 633,000. Well, there you go. NXT 786,000. Holy shit. What was on NXT? I should have taped that. I think there was a and again, I didn't watch NXT, but I think Keith Lee had a three-way match with a couple of guys. I really don't know what was on NXT. I have no idea. <laughs> Or maybe, you know what, it, at this point, it might not be about what's on X, NXT, it might be about what's been on AEW. It, it, maybe they're finally realizing, what the fuck, these guys can't get this shit right. Do you think any of it has to do with the fact that you're not reviewing AEW anymore? Well, <laughs> I, you know, I'd, I'd hate to be the cause of their downfall. We might have, we might have to res research the, the statistics and see if, if I can... I'd hate to be the cause of someone else's fucking going out of business because I didn't give them enough attention. 
But I, you know, I've only got so much attention and there's not enough to go around. Everybody wants my attention these days. Some people wait till the crack of doom to get it. If you're, but a- anyway, if you're AEW, do you panic or do you just say this is a one week thing? Let's not worry too much about it. I mean, it's obviously they well, lost, but they lost by a lot out of nowhere. I mean, I don't know what, I mean, AEW didn't have any real marquee matches and, you know, a lot of the top guys for them, for their audience, like the Young Bucks, Omega Page, not even wrestling on the show. I don't know if that had anything to do with it, but they got their ass kicked by NXT. I, I, I wouldn't panic after one week of television losing the ratings war. No, but it, it, it's in, in the Attitude Era when everybody was tearing their hair out every Tuesday morning when they'd get the ratings, even when WCW was winning. And everybody else was, oh, God damn, and shaking their hands and clutching their pearls and everything. I always felt it didn't matter that they won the fucking ratings. It was who had the better show building to the future, leading to someone not burning themselves out, not doing stupid things for no fucking apparent purpose than to pop shit. The, the, the booking meant nothing. The... The WCW television shows of 99 produced the WCW television shows of 2001. They shot everything they knew how to shoot and they couldn't shoot anymore. And the whole thing fell in a fucking hole because nobody was the leader and nobody had a clear picture. And even if Vince wasn't winning the war, he was still doing better consistent business in all metrics and or having a a clear path of what was going on and getting talent over and just not shooting himself in the foot. The, the more, the established company may not always win the ratings war or draw the biggest house, but all it has to do is just not fuck up. Whereas the fucking challenging company has to be better, especially in, in a way, you know, that war in the nineties was close. I just always was convinced because Vince in the long run ran the better, more organized business and had the more experience and et cetera was going to come out because the other guys were doing so many crazy things, not even their wrestling matches, just the crazy business practices and the bullshit. You can't go on that way. This war is not nearly that close. The WWE's developmental brand just beat their fucking flagship show. And the talent rosters, there's no comparison. And the business level of of revenues, there's no comparison. But if they wanted to make a splash, AEW, the sports-based presentation, could have come out and concentrated on doing everything as right as possible from the start. But the people that were chosen to be responsible for that were not capable of it because they'd never done it before, and they have a weird idea of what the fuck wrestling's supposed to be based on wrestling in front of these fucking tiny crowds for so long that enjoyed this type of thing and it skewed their fucking brains up. So now every time that AEW for the last nine months on television has had the chance to debut new talent that could make a difference, they have nullified them or gotten them under instead of over. And now it all just looks the same every week, except when you have MJF have a single match Cody have a fucking dramatic classic or fucking now FTR have a state of the art tag team match. You got a bunch of fucking independent looking guys running around doing the same shit to each other that everybody else does. And that gets old and that's not opinion. That's just fact. That's what the, the, that's what they are. They are not building viewers and they can blame the pandemic, but they're not building viewers. They're losing viewers because they're not building their talent. They're just letting them do whatever the fuck it is that they think that week they should do. Good God. I I booked the Smoky Mountain Heavyweight, Smoky Mountain Title Heavyweight Tournament. Smoke, I'll say this again. I booked the Smoky Mountain Heavyweight <laughs> Title Tournament two years before it happened in the car, and I got six out of the eight guys I wanted. It, it, you know, they, they just say, Look, what the fuck? And they don't know. They don't understand. They don't get it. They're not just playing for the indie crowd anymore. <laughs> Any further audience that they get is going to expect a level of professionalism that none of them are showing. So that's the end of that. That's all I got to say about that. All 
All right. What are you doing this week? Another action-packed week on the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network. If you hurt my ears, I'm going to fuck you up. Get information about all shows on Twitter, <laughs> at Super Podcasts, or on Facebook, facebook.com slash Arcadian Vanguard. This week on the network, breaking kayfabe with Baldrin and Barry, the boys look at Poffomania. Randy Savage and Lanny Poffo in Memphis, 1984, including a look at the Poffos, or in this case, Lanny Poffo and Randy Savage, versus the Rock and Roll Express. Hear that today at BaldrinPod.com, or available wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Of course, you can always check out the Mid-Atlantic Championship Podcast with Mike Sempervivi and Roman Gomez as they review Mid-Atlantic TV week by week starting in 1982. Another couple of episodes just went up this past week. Check it out today at midatlanticpod.com or available wherever you find your favorite shows. Next week, right here on the Jim Cornette Experience, I will probably be announcing a new podcast to join the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network. Stay tuned for that announcement. Now, wait a minute. You're not going to just leave it there. It's like, how do you keep an idiot in suspense? I'll tell you tomorrow. You're not just going to drop it now. You're going to make us wait. I'm going to make everyone wait. That's how you do a program, AEW. But <laughs> there's also the 605 Super Podcast, The Mothership. Thank you very much. Uh, the show was supposed to be out by now, but a bunch of scandals broke out. And it <laughs> fucked with our recording schedule, but hopefully the new 605 will be out in the next several days. I got to finish up a few things, and I'm hoping that nothing else happens. I don't know. What else Mr. Cornette will be involved in? There have been so many rumors about murder, extortion. I don't know what it'll be. Littering. Littering. Literary garbage. There's so many different <laughs> claims. But the 605 Super Podcast, like I said, hopefully up in the next several days, trying to finish up everything right now. You can go through the archive today, as so many of you have been doing. Thank you so much. 605pod.com are available wherever you find your favorite podcasts, The Mothership. Thank you. From one mother to another. All right. We said we were going to have a palate cleanser and watch and review a classic wrestling program. And I thought, just because it's something I wanted to watch again, as I mentioned, I hadn't watched it all the way through in years and years and years. The first Clash of Champions on TBS, well, in March 27, 1988, um, from Greensboro at the Greensboro Coliseum. I have a lot of people always, you know, write and ask me, well, I'm just starting to get into the older wrestling. You know, I wasn't around for it the first time. What should I watch? What should I do? <clears throat> I got a clash. One is a really good, uh, NWA big show to watch. If you're just starting to get into the real TBS era. Uh, obviously Crockett had had big show Starcade dated back to 83. The first closed circuit broadcast of Starcade was Starcade 85. So it done 85, 86, and 87. The, the NWA had done live big shows, um, but had, and had just started trying to dip their foot in pay-per-view, which is how TBS started getting involved. But we had never done a live TV special. Even the superstars on the Superstation back in 86 had been taped at the Omni on a Sunday night and then aired the following Friday on TBS. But this was live TV and it was there to counter program WrestleMania that year. And we've talked about this show in deep dives of the Crockett business at the time. And we've talked about it in terms of the wars between uh, the WWF and, and the NWA over getting on pay-per-view and Vince trying to block Crockett and all that stuff, but we've never just reviewed it as a show. And even it wasn't, and for the reasons we'll talk about, it wasn't the greatest performance that every NWA star put on ever in one night. There wasn't time for that. <clears throat> but there was a couple of very memorable things and and just some stuff now watching it with today's eyes that, people can go back and, and see you don't see any more from anybody. So I thought we would go through these matches and we're going to save the midnight and fantastics match for last because we're going to do a little watch along. Like it's only 12 minutes and something where we 
we watch it and we talk about it. And that way you can go to the network. We're giving Vince is getting nine bucks from all of us these days. And you can watch it with the inside commentary going on. But anyway, um, I wish this, honestly, the, you know, once again, I wish so many of the shows that the house shows that had these really long and classic matches and these big crowds were available to watch like this because now people go back and there's the Greensboro Coliseum. It's March of 88. It's live TV, but there's only five or 6,000 people there. And I say only that was bad for Greensboro. And this was at a time when we ran Greensboro every couple or three weeks, if not at least once a month. But Brian tried to help me explain the difference in those days versus now. We were surprised we had five or 6,000 people because it was on TV for free. Why would anybody go? There were 12 to 15 live wrestling events in the Greensboro Coliseum with all these stars per year. This is the one they can stay home, not have to buy a ticket, not have to park, blah, 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 and still see for free, and they still came. But now, the way people look at wrestling since it's changed is like, well, they should have been sold out because it was a big show. It didn't work that way then. It didn't make any sense to go watch something live and pay for it when you could see it on TV for free. Have, have I covered that properly? I think so. And of you course, know, it, George Scott didn't promote that Superdome show a year later. Well, the, yeah, there was all kinds of reasons why that fucking thing wasn't seen by anybody. But in this case, this was the first one. It was brand new. So we knew going in that there was going to be nobody in Greensboro, but I'd love to see some of those. That place, when there, when there was 16,000 people in that place, it was fucking cool. Anyway, um, Tony Schiavone, Bob Caudill, and Jim Ross, our announced team. This was when JR was in his prime of being able to call wrestling as a sport. Going back and listening to Tony now, then, he had excitement. He was calling the matches. He had oomph. And he, was, he was still in wrestling in his head. And that's the way I remember hearing him. And now when I hear him just kind of verbally shaking his head, what's going on, and kind of laughing like, wow, it's crazy now, folks. He's not into wrestling in his head now. He doesn't know what the fuck he's looking at in front of him. And he's just he's trying to figure out a way to describe it like he used because he was a baseball announcer. He was a sports announcer. You can't do that. Call this shit today like a sport. He was so much better then, and that's why people remember him fondly. Um, the ring announcer was Tom Miller, the best. Oh God, I love Doctor Tom Miller. He's my favorite. <laughs> and Tom Miller was the Greensboro ring announcer. He was like six foot six. He was huge. He towered over everybody, and all. And he had the old time boxing ring announcer's voice. But the first time I was in Greensboro, they never clued him in that I was going to do the introduction. And he started trying to introduce us, and I went over to grab the microphone from him, and he didn't want to give it to me. We had a tug of war. I was with a giant ring announcer. I'm trying to take the microphone away. He he had the great voice, and if he did, did it like he was used to doing it, he was fine. But in this case, he had to re read the rules of this gimmick match they had between... Jimmy Garvin and and Mike Rotunda for the world TV title. It was three five-minute rounds and a one-count pin. And everybody's saying, what the fuck? Part of this came up as Rotunda, obviously, is in Kevin Sullivan's varsity club. He's an amateur wrestler. Everybody knew that. Mike Rotunda was a real good hotshot amateur wrestler. Jimmy Garvin has switched babyface the previous year. He's... He and Precious are being targeted by Kevin Sullivan. So Garvin's going to wrestle this hotshot amateur. And Jimmy Garvin, unbeknownst to people, was actually a pretty good state amateur in Florida years ago. <clears throat> but anyway, they were they did very little amateur wrestling, but that was the rules by, or the reason behind these rules. And Teddy Long was the referee. And they didn't have much time on this show. Nobody had a lot of time on this show because the main event was going Broadway. But they, at the same time, everybody, the angles, the fans knew what was going on. They knew why everybody was mad so they could get right into things. And by the way, just for comparison, we talked about ratings a minute ago. Well, this was on TBS on a Sunday afternoon. 
I can't remember what time it started. Was it Brian? Was it a two or three o'clock or whatever the fuck? Or did they do the five o'clock that year? I forget what time. Whatever. Sunday afternoon on TBS, which at this time was available in forty million homes, which is approximately a, a third. Well, a little over a third. They're available. What about a ninety or hundred million now? Anyway, available in 40 million homes, the show did a 5.8 rating and a 13 share. That's cable ratings. Cable ratings were different than network in those days because of the disparity in the available homes. 5.8, 13 share, 4 million viewers on a network available in 40 million homes. By contrast, both AEW and NXT on Wednesday night did less than a million on networks available in between 90 and 100 million homes. The Sting and Flair match on this clash peaked at a 7.8 rating and a 15 share with over 5 million viewers. It was the most watched pro wrestling match in cable TV history. It was the most watched pro wrestling match in America since the... Uh, that Was that uh, the, the Saturday Night Live? Saturday Night Live. Saturday Night's main event... Era. The, the Friday night event with Hogan Andre was a few months before this. It was a few months. Okay, it was it was the most watched of all since that Hogan and Andre thing, which was the most watched match since the network TV days of the 50s. And this record for Sting and Flair lasted until the Attitude Era 10 years later. So, <clears throat> you know, golly, I'm sorry that... Uh, their 750,000 viewers or 500,000 viewers or whatever doesn't impress me like it impresses everybody else. This is why. Anyway, Jimmy Garvin and Rotunda. They had a, did a five-minute round where they had a wrestling match. There was some heat between them. Fucking tempers flared. Jimmy Garvin shined. Rotunda got a cheap shot in at four minutes or so, and Garvin sold. And finally, at the end of the first round, the people were going crazy for a Rotunda, Rotunda trying to turn him to get a one-count pin. And the bell rang. Rest period. Next round, Rotunda continues the heat. All of a sudden, the crowd fucking blows for Jimmy Garvin, slamming Mike Rotunda off the top rope and making his comeback. Boom, boom, boom. They did a little distraction with Kevin Sullivan and Precious. Sullivan tries to interfere. Precious hangs on his ankle. And when Jimmy Garvin laid his hands on fucking Kevin Sullivan, the people lost their shit. And as soon as he does that, just nails him a time or two. Rotunda gets a roll up and a one count. The heel wins. Boom. Rick Steiner comes in, the third member of the varsity club. And the heels start getting heat on Jimmy Garvin until Precious grabs the fucking two before that Steiner had brought in and fucking hits Rick Steiner with a two before and then grabs Kevin Sullivan's coat hanger and puts it around his neck and the people absolutely lost their minds. This whole thing, entrances and everything, fucking nine minutes and they were out of there and the people were going crazy and nothing was stupid or insulting and they got the point across. And they're working every night in house shows all across the country so they left with some heat on the heels to continue those matches. Nice opening segment. Yeah. Imagine that. Instead of fucking giving away shit that you're you're gonna fucking try to charge people for between people that don't know how to do it. Mike Rotunda, his run from like nineteen eighty eight till the summer of eighty nine is so great. I've never liked anything with him as much as I like varsity club Mike Rotunda. Not to put IRS down or Michael Wall Street or Mike Rotundo. <laughs> But him in that Syracuse singlet worked with that haircut and just, he looks like the preppy jock that you want to see get their ass kicked. And he was so smug. And the Varsity Club was one of the few highlights of 1988 NWA. Those promos with Sullivan. And then you had the dynamic between Rotunda and Steiner eventually leading to them wrestling each other. But Mike Rotunda, 1988 Mike Rotunda is so great. Well, and it, it because it was the most real life of him an amateur shooter that was any i'm not saying he was a smug prick but he was an amateur shooter that could have that little smirk on his face and then he's he's the straightest looking guy in the room next to steiner who was a maniac and sullivan who's a lunatic 
And it just, it, it was a nice combination. It played off everybody well. Um, then Bob Caudill introduced, inter introduced, interviewed Dr. Death, Steve Williams, who had just obviously come over a few months earlier from the remnants of the UWF. And <laughs> did you notice Dr. Death was Scott Steiner 15 years earlier? That's a nice way of putting it. This, Actually, 20 years, 20 years earlier. This is not a good <laughs> promo. Oh, no, no. It, it was awful. a Dr. Death promo. Yeah. He made absolute, they gave him, for whatever reason, too much time. And uh, so, some of these interview segments, you'll see they're standalone segments because on live TV, they didn't go to commercial break during any of these matches, including the 45 minutes that Flair and Sting went. The commercial breaks like a real sporting event came in between. So to have enough segments, to have enough breaks, they'd come back for a short segment, like an interview like this, and then go right back to break and then come back and have a full length match. But anyway, no doc couldn't talk. And if he was a fired up heel with an issue, or if he was a fired up baby face with an issue in mid South, especially where he, you know, had Watts hands on with him, it was okay. But no, just a, bland promo about all the things he was going to do. It made no sense. It was Scott Steiner 20 years before Steiner started doing math and it, you know, didn't do him any favors. Then we come to the U S tag team title match, which we're going to save till the end because we're going to set that up and talk about it and then, and do the watch along. But basically, uh, it was a five match card and, and we had to be on second because then we had to have uh, Dusty and the Road Warriors. We had to have the world tag title. And we had to have the world heavyweight title. So we got a pretty, you know, virgin crowd out of it. But as we will make most of it, as we'll talk about here later on, um, we'll skip ahead for that now. So, and you can save your thoughts also. But I don't know why this placement of this, but we, <laughs> the way they placed this was, the interview with me and Ken Osmond came after I'd already been out there beating the piss out of air. I know it was pre-taped, but still, you would have thought they'd wanted to leave us with a little heat. But then instead, here I come with Ken Osmond. But have, have, I, have I ever told you the story of me meeting Eddie Haskell? You haven't, but let me just clarify here. Ken Osmond was the actor that played Eddie Haskell, one of the great heels in the history of television. Yes. You didn't do an interview with Ken Osmond. It was presented as you doing an interview with Eddie Haskell. Well, yeah, but here's the thing. Nobody knew this was going to fucking happen until we all showed up. TBS had helped the, the uh, obviously they're giving us two and a half hours of television time on a Sunday opposite WrestleMania. They built the opening graphics and, and they tried to present this show like a big time sporting event. And this was the first time they were really going to, publicly and acknowledge that they're really behind their wrestling program at the same time one of the very few original television shows being produced by tbs was the new leave it to beaver and ken osmond was reprising his role uh as eddie haskell and oh, thank you, Mrs. Cleaver. You know, the, the, I, I guess there's people out there that have never watched Leave It to Beaver now, but Eddie Haskell was the juvenile delinquent friend of uh, Beaver's brother, Wally, who was always trying to get everybody in trouble. But whenever he was around an authority figure, like a mother or a parent or a teacher, he was so polite and, oh, hello, Mrs. Cleaver. He was full <laughs> of shit, right? <laughs> so they, <clears throat> they send Eddie Haskell, Ken Osmond, to Greensboro for this big live television show that they're doing for the wrestling, and they want to promote their other show, the new Leave It to Beaver. And the only idea they had was that when Ken Osmond shows up, Eddie Haskell is going to have an interview with Jim Cornette. And that's it. They didn't fucking tell us anything. when I got there. They said, oh, we're going to do this. I'm like, okay. And I'm waiting for somebody to say, what are we supposed to be doing? And nobody knew. And finally, Ken Osmond comes over and says, hey, let's, let's figure something out. So we went over 10 minutes before we shot this thing in one take. We went out, uh, out back of the Greensboro Coliseum and said, okay, we see why they're doing this because I'm the mama's boy. He's the fucking, you know, prick teenager, you know, asshole, heelish uh, people. So we just came up with some shit to, to say to each other that would work 
Eddie Haskell's gimmick and Jim Cornette's gimmick. And everybody's like, oh, Cornette, you hate celebrities in this in the business. Well, I wouldn't have picked to do this if it had been me, but since we're doing it, this worked because it didn't make any of the boys look stupid. And it actually didn't even expose fucking leave it to Beaver's business because Eddie Haskell was in gimmick. And it was it, it Bob Caudle, who I guarantee you, as Jim Ross once called him, the epitome of a white man wearing brown shoes. I don't even know if he watched Leave It to Beaver first run, but he introduced Eddie Haskell like Eddie Haskell was the the actor and the star of the show because he didn't know the difference. So Ken Osmond was referred to by a few people as Ken Osmond, but he was really being Eddie Haskell and not breaking kayfabe. And he was talking to me about my rich mother, and I was talking to him about his fucking letter jacket at Mayfield. And people had to either think, either Cornette's such a fucking idiot, he thinks that guy really is a dick, or really is Eddie Haskell. Or they might have thought, we don't know, both these pricks are just trying to fucking get over at each other's expense. But we didn't do anything to make the wrestling business look stupid or phony. And Eddie Haskell did not offer to take any bumps. Not to be lost in the shuffle, Vern Gagne brought Lumpy Rutherford in for an angle on AWA TV. That's <laughs> <At> Super Clash. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so yes, so the, I I was had a face to face with Eddie Haskell on TBS. What do you prefer? Your face to face with Eddie Haskell? Your face to face with Grandpa Munster? Well, I no, I'm hot about that because I got Eddie Haskell in person. Grandpa Munster wasn't even there. We, me and Michael Hayes, did our fucking pre tapes and. And they edited it in. I didn't get to meet Grandpa Munster. What a shame. Anyway, they they did an interview with Gary Hart and Al Perez. Gary Hart was great, as usual. Al Perez was nothing special and not great, and shows again why that he was insane when he had thought he should be the world champion. Hey, can I ask you a question? Sure. When I watched this, it popped up in my mind. If Al Perez doesn't leave under the circumstances for which he left, which I think were he didn't want to put Ric Flair over in Miami, does Gary Hart get Muda? Uh, I'm sure he would have. Yes, I'm sure he would have. Because not only, it's not like, as we saw with the Varsity Club, they weren't limited, or later on when Gary had Muda and Dragon Master and Terry Funk, they wouldn't limit the guy to just one member of a stable. And Muda was perfect for Gary because of the Kabuki uh, connection. And Gary always liked the foreign menaces that didn't speak, that he could create the mysterious backstories around, etc. So anyway, did you notice that then it was time the Crockett Cup was going to take place less than a month after this, 88 Crockett Cup. And it was time for the seedings to be announced, and it was announced on the big television special, Bob Caudle pitched to Francis Cockett. <laughs> <laughs> who was dressed in a ball gown with dangly earrings that if they'd have been real would have cost six million dollars um and she gave the crockett cup seeds and i think she ran linda mcmahon a real good run for her money for the worst promotion family res television personality awful Cheap graphics, horrible delivery, monotone, deer in the headlights, Stan. I'm not even knocking Francis. They shouldn't have done this. They kept doing it. And they shouldn't have done it. And I'm going to make some more references here before we're done with this show. But this was what doomed the NWA and later WCW to be viewed as second class to the WWF in the wars because a Crockett was running out of a converted convenience store on fucking you know, Briar Bend Drive in Charlotte with the same three accountants and secretaries he'd had since the fucking 50s. And Vince was building a big company. And Crockett was putting family members on. Even if it, the Crockett Cup was named after his father, that doesn't mean a family member had to legitimately be a television personality to announce it every year. And Vince got Muhammad Ali and Liberace. And later on, we end up with Jason Hervey and Ken Osmond. So it wasn't the wrestling product, the booking, or the talent. It was the perception by these awful visuals. Anyway, 
Then the big barbed wire match. And uh, Dusty loved to gimmick the big shows, even when he only had five minutes, five matches to work on. But six-man barbed wire match, Road Warriors and Dusty Rhodes with Paul Ellering against Powers of Pain, the Barbarian and Warlord, with Uncle Ivan Koloff and Paul Jones. And they had done and referred to the bench press angle where the Powers of Pain in Greensboro month or two before had beat to piss out of the road warriors and hit animal in the face with the weightlifting plate and animals wearing the fucking hockey face mask as the protector. Cause he's got the broken eye sock. And I don't know why they put the barbed wire in. Cause they were <laughs> several times like right at the start animal just dropped down and slid right out under the fucking ropes to chase Paul Jones and kill the barbed wire. <clears throat> but it was, you know, it's, it's a gimmick. They put a hat on a hat here too, back in the eighties, folks. Um, Ivan Koloff was the oldest guy and he was taking all the bumps, including a big press slam off a fucking animal. This was a six way, what we used to call a meat chopper, just chop meat brawl, uh, milk, the barbed wire. Ivan and dusty got some fucking color, but not much. And the announcers never referenced blood because they were still, treading lightly with TBS and whether they would accept it or not. But the people were insane for everything they did because of the, the story, the, the story behind this was such that there was no story to this match. There's six guys in the whole way for five or six minutes with barbed wire wrapped around the ropes and everybody's just chopping meat and punching and kicking each other. And every once in a while, Animal will get a big press slam or Dusty will get the big fucking flip-flop and fly in the elbow. And the people will come absolutely fucking unglued. And then finally, Barbarian comes off the top with a diving headbutt. But who was it? Dusty moved and he hit Barbarian hit Warlord. Boom, one, two, three. Five-minute match, out, done. The people are screaming. But then the heels turn around and get some heat again because of the house show matches that they've still got to do. And they take Animal's mask off and try to fuck up his ba bad eye long enough until Dusty and Hawk make the save and the people cream their jeans again. That was what that was, and that's what it was supposed to be. On the WWE Network version, they have the original music still, because this is when Crockett started getting his own music as opposed to using commercial music. But they all came out to Dusty Rhodes' music instead of the Road Warriors' music. Well. That's because the Road Warriors at the time were still using Iron Man, but Dusty had gotten, what was it that he got? I fucking forgot the goddamn music he was using there because I skipped the entrance on this one. I don't remember the name of the song. I just know how it's. The point is, it was, it was, his, it was his own. It wasn't like Ozzy Osbourne. Um, anyway, the next promo for the short segment was Nikita Koloff. And boy, here you see another problem. Nikita Koloff, the Russian nightmare, the way that Dusty brought him in and introduced him as the nephew of Ivan Koloff, the, the man who would have been the Olympic champion if fucking the Russian, you know, the Olympics hadn't been boycotted in 1984, the evil Dolph Lundgren fucking ripoff from the Rocky Four movie. Um, impervious to pain, 300 pounds, that goddamn jacked up body, bald head. That, for two years, what a fucking run that was, right? He was over, incredible, out of nowhere to main event, Charlotte in front of 25 or 30, almost 30,000 people with Ric Flair after being in the business for, what, a year and a half. By March of 88... He's become a baby face. <laughs> he's out there in a suit. He's still trying to do a Russian promo, but now he's, he's trying to be a nice Russian. Instead of just, if he dies, he dies. You tell him he's fucking talking a mile a minute. He's anti-drug. He's a cosmopolitan Russian. He's wearing a suit. He's got a nice haircut. He's telling the people he's, he's talking to the kids against drugs. This was when he first started finding religion. His his wife was ill at the time. I'm not making any fun of that. This interview went forever, and this interview is also why Nikita Koloff was one of the biggest box office attractions in the business in his rookie year and never again. Because this Nikita Koloff was not going to fucking fly. 
not unless he was the host of the Russian version of Dancing with the Stars. I have to admit, I was impressed. It went a long time, this interview. And I didn't even know what he was talking about by the end of it. But he had that voice going the whole time. And you try to do that. You try to blah, blah, blah. It's hard to do that for a minute yeah. straight. I don't know how he didn't kill his voice. Hey, well, he used to use it on the plane. I told you that. He he got so into making sure that nobody saw through him when 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 he was on top that when Crockett first got his plane and it was just us, the boys, riding on it, he was talking to the boys on the plane in the fucking accent until Arn said, cue ball, cut the fucking accent. We know you're Scotty Simpson from Minnesota. Anyway, we follow that with the world tag team title match, Tully Blanchard and Arn Anderson with J.J. Dillon against the challengers, Barry Windham and Lex Luger. Another tag team, and by the way, everything so far on the card has been completely different from all the other matches. This was no exception. They got some time to settle in and have a little tag match here, even though it was shorter than most NWA matches. This match in the arena would have gone 20 or 25 minutes. Well, they didn't have that time on television, but once again, it was ready-made. These heels were so good that all the baby faces had to do was clothesline and pose. And, but even then, I mean, Barry Wyndham was one of the best workers in the world. Lex Luger, for all the criticism he got back then, and everybody knocking him, and, oh, come on, you know, package, he's so green. He looks like the best wrestler in the world with today's eyes when you don't see anybody with that size and that body that's doing those fucking power slams, and his shit looked good now compared to what we see today. Let me tell you something. I know it was a popular thing in the sheets, how awful Lex Luger was. But Lex Luger from 1988 to 1990 is fantastic. Yeah. As a babyface or a heel. He was really fantastic as a heel in 89, but he's great. And you watch this, like you said, you watch it after seeing all the shit we've seen the last several years. Considering he'd only been in the business, what, three years by this point in time? Uh, not, no, not that long. Not full time. Two and a half years, let's Probably. say. Probably, Yeah. He's really good here. I mean, I know it's a popular thing to say Lex Luger sucks and he always sucked. It's just not true. <laughs> anyway, um, the baby faces bumped Arn and Tully around for a second, and then they started heat on Luger within the first minute of the match and got just a touch of steam on him so that they could give BW a hot tag. And because Barry was so smooth, he's come back, the great sleeper spot with Tully where he snags the sleeper and Tully tries to go through the ropes and he holds on to it and they're out on the floor with the sleeper. Um, they teased a little false heat there just so that they could give Barry a comeback because he was so good at it. But they, at the same time, they wanted Barry to be the guy to sell because he was so much better at that than Lex. And then Lex got the final comeback anyway. Uh, JJ does a distraction spot and they get some heat on Barry and they, they were sprinting through this at a pay, a faster pace than they would have normally worked a house show match <clears throat> because you want things to register. But at the same time, nobody made any mistakes and everybody was still with it. They didn't run off and leave people. And the crowd by five minutes into the match was fucking molten. And then Tully and BW did the perfect double knockout. If anybody wants to go back and watch that, it's 53 minutes and 45 seconds on the counter into this program. If you want to see how to do a double knockout, the way it's supposed to be done, the way it doesn't look planned, the way everybody just doesn't run into each other and fall down for no reason like they're supposed to, Tully Blanchard and Barry Windham did it perfectly. On the fly, looked good, blindside, boom. And then they go down, and then as they get hooked back up, they do the double bridge spot with Barry Windham at six fucking six and 260. And having, they've been working that fucking hard and that quick. And then they do the, you know, the double bridge spot like Flair and Steamboat or Flair and all his favorite opponents used to do. <clears throat> Headlock, hip lock, head scissors, fucking get up into the fucking reverse 69 position, double bridge up, and then fucking BW goes right into a side salto. And then when finally Tully stops BW, hits him with the slingshot suplex, one, two, BW powers a shoulder out, and the crowd goes ballistic. 
because somebody kicked out of the slingshot suplex. Holy shit. Finally, Barry makes his hot tag, and now here comes Lex's big comeback. This is the final one, and it's huge, and they feed for him. And then as they get into the four-way without umpteen false finishes back and forth because that would have been great if this was another match, but this match didn't need it. They didn't have time for it. They just told the fucking story. Come back four-way. JJ puts a chair in the corner, and Arn tries to fucking run Luger into it, but Luger foils him and shovels him off. Head first, Arn into the chair. One, two, three. Huge pop. New World Tag Team Champions. And the people give him a fucking standing ovation. <clears throat> Especially after they'd done the deal in the Midnight Fantastics match that we'll talk about in a minute, where the people thought they'd seen a title change and popped on it, and then they didn't get it. But they still bought this one because there wasn't two referees and they could see what had happened now. They weren't going to get fooled again. And what the fuck? Were they, were they out there? Entrances and everything, 15 minutes? And it tore the fucking house down. Do you think Dusty already knew he was going to turn Barry heel? Uh, probably. Probably, because when was that at this point? That has to be within a month, two months after this, I think. Yeah, so basically, well, because Luger had split off from the Horsemen uh, in the, you know, the previous year. Because Barry's heel by the time he gets to Crockett Cup, I think, isn't he? I th- yes, that's what they did. The, they did the switch and vacated the... But the point is, Luger had switched and got away from the horsemen the previous year. So out of the two of them, Luger had the involvement with the horsemen. So it would people would probably think if anybody was going to betray the new, the new tag team champions, it would be the ex-horsemen, which is why he switched the other guy. <laughs> anyway, um... But yeah, they, you know, and that also Tully and, and Arn were going into the Crockett Cup as the number one seed. So now suddenly they're not the champions anymore. There's some controversy going on. But anyway, it, it, it just, and it's, ref- and also it's not only refreshing to see uh, a n- more tag team work like that, but boy, Tully and Arn look, uh, or I should say FTR put me such in mind of Tully and Arn. Yeah. physically and and just their work and just the everything on point the little things and etc but but yeah a great tag team match that's unheralded there that nobody remembers that match off this show they don't talk about it as cuz these guys were that good every night it it didn't stand out at the time anyway which just leaves the big one right and this was once again a tale of the in-ring being so outstanding and untouchable and everything else about TBS and Crockett's foray into national wrestling looking minor league. <laughs> they got the NWA World Heavyweight Championship on the line. Ric Flair defending against Sting. Sting's first big match. And this is wild. That, and by the way, I can't remember when it was, but within a few months, I think, beforehand, Flair and Wyndham had actually drawn... 16,000 people to Greensboro for the world title match. 130-something thousand dollar house. Sting had never had a big main event match like this. That's why they didn't want to give away Flair and Wyndham or Flair and Luger. So for the main event, they said, well, let's, let's give Sting a shot at the title, but it's not giving away a big marquee match. What it did was make Sting's career because Flair loved the guy. As far as his athleticism, his look, his personality... The way the people were starting to get with him, he wanted to make him. So he's, he was all on board with this. And this ended up being not only the match of the year that year with all the voting and everything, but also the most important match probably that TBS broadcast in the their early years of wrestling involvement because it's what made Sting really a star on the level with Wyndham and Luger and Flair and the Horsemen and all those guys. He wasn't then. People don't remember that now because they aren't old enough to have been fans before Sting was a big star. <clears throat> so they've got this match, but to acquiesce to showbiz involvement, to TBS, to the new TV partner, whatever, 
they're going to go, they've got to shoehorn the celebrities in some kind of way. And they always intended to have a Broadway on this. They didn't want to beat Sting, but at the same time, they didn't want to fucking, you know, do anything screwy. So they always thought they'd go Broadway. So they decided to have judges. The judges were Baltimore promoter Gary Juster, my old friend Gutless Gary, who <laughs> nobody, he wasn't like, uh, the promoter on television, they just announced he was the Baltimore promoter, so he sounded like he knew what he was doing. Wrestling legend Sandy Scott, who everybody in the Carolinas knew and nobody else you know, knew anymore because he'd been retired for 20 fucking years. Penthouse pet Patty Mullen. Yeah. And Flair got to do the promo saying, well, I know who she's going to be voting for. He was right. And then here's the problem. They also announced Ken Osmond slash Eddie Haskell. And for whatever reason, I don't know whether that's when Jason Hervey had just started. No, he wasn't fucking Missy yet. He wasn't even of age yet. No, and Missy wasn't even there. Missy wasn't, Missy wasn't even there. It was Owen. Missy wasn't even there. <laughs> but Jason Hervey, another, the, he was on what? The Wonder Years at that point. And an actor, and he shows up, and he's hanging around. That's how he, he's a wrestling fan, but he's a TV star, so they put him on, and that's how he met Missy and ended up fucking around with Missy, was being at all these wrestling shows. But they announced them at ringside, too, even though they weren't judges, and they sat at the judges' table, so there's five judges, but only three of them got a vote. I think I'd have rather had Eddie Haskell's word over the penthouse pet. Do you remember what movie she starred in? What classic? I, I do not. It used to be on TV all the time. I don't think it'll be on any TV network anytime soon. She was the star of the classic Frankenhooker. Do you remember Frankenhooker? I remember that now, Frankenhooker. They put a hooker together from parts, right? Yeah, well, the guy, he concocts like this form of crack cocaine where if you smoke it, you explode. <laughs> and he gets a whole bunch of hookers back to his hotel room <laughs> Because his girlfriend had died, but he has her head, and he needs to reconstruct her, and then he decides he doesn't want to do it, he can't do this, but the hookers find the drugs, and they start smoking it, like they're Jake the Snake Roberts, and they all just blow up, and then he has the parts to put Frank and Hooker, who is played by Patty Mullen, together. I wonder if she's like the other pets. The penthouse pets were all escorts. Get your mind out of the gutter. No, it's a fact. They were. I, used to I do not. I do not like. I'm a prude. I do not like sex talk. <laughs> Intimate relations should be between one man and one woman. With a, a, as small a crowd as possible watching. I think what I said fit into those guidelines. Anyway. Um, Frankenhooker. Frankenhooker. Now on DVD. <laughs> so... And J.J. Dillon, by the way, uh, Flair's manager, was hung in a small cage over the uh, dusty loved gimmick and everything. Uh, but but once, he, once the bell rings, this was the only long match so they could take their time. Sting was still huge, but he was so athletic. And this stood out as a match for the world title. Uh, you got the impression it was important, even with all the goofy judges and everything, the way that the referee and the guys in the ring treated it, the way that the announcers spoke about it. It's an athletic contest for something, for something that's important. And the people in the building, they were blowing when Sting would reverse Flair's top wrist lock. They, oh! And this was an old-fashioned the bones of an old fashioned NWA world championship match with a modern eighties flair spin on it. It was paced and built slow from the start. So it could continue to unfold and lead to making the challenger look like a star. The spots built and paid off, but then Rick would slow it back down. Cause he knew that they had time to fucking put in, um, I mentioned it here again. This is where I had noted that the announcing Tony Schiavone had so much more energy and seemed so much more genuine. He didn't sound like he was either just shaking his head. Like what the fuck am I looking at? Or how can I call this? It's not that he's trying to make fun of anything even now, but he just doesn't know what he's looking at. Can I say though? I think, yeah. Cause I like their work in the future. I personally would have preferred Jim Ross and Bob Cottle doing the match. I thought Bob Cottle yeah. added a lot. They were folksy. 
they were folksy with each other. Yeah, well, I just had a three-man booth. I, JR and Tony had been fine. JR and Bob were really well smoothed together. I think there was always some... There was there was a little tension between JR and Tony because they were both at one time. Tony was the lead guy till JR showed up, and then JR was the lead guy, but Tony was the second guy. Bob didn't care. Not that he didn't care. He always worked hard, but he didn't care whether he was the lead dog or the last dog as long as, you know, he was just there to do what he was supposed to do. Um, but all through this thing was green and he wasn't smooth, but he did everything that Flair called. Even if it wasn't pretty, I guarantee you, Ric Flair never called Sting to do another flying head scissors after he they almost got killed with this one because it, it, nobody does the the old flying head scissors like it used to be done with by the baby faces, the sideways and up, and the old Ricky Gibson. It, they all do the Hurricane Ranas now, and it, I don't know what fuck Sting thought that it was supposed to look like. But anyway. Uh, I like the idea they announced the standby matches because they got 45 minutes left of television broadcast time. People know that. So if this match ends early, we've got standby matches. Uh, I think Sting and Flair still have the most photogenic press slam ever. It just looked great when they did it. But if you go back and look at this match, they kept the people's fucking attention. It was ebbing and flowing. Flair was getting weaker and sting was getting stronger it was 20 minutes in almost before they went to the floor and then there was a little dust up out there and then fucking flair ran sting into the railing and then left him and they beat the count back in and left sting to get a breather the the now everybody's trying to do the most dangerous shit possible on the floor and and risk dangerous injury before it was a go out and get a little breather on the floor <laughs> Uh, Flair then really kicks in the heat. He's aggressive. He's vicious. He's standing over him and gripping him in the face and impo imposing his will. Tommy young, best referee ever would add to the heels heat by looking like he was really trying to referee and stop some cheating, which meant it wasn't his fault because he was just a limp dick in the ring. It was the heels fault. Cause he was really overbearing. This referee he was trying his best. They go back out on the floor, but it looks vicious and serious, not stupid and staged. And as I mentioned, less dangerous than what they were doing in the ring. That's the idea. When you go out on the floor, you can take a pissy bump because it's concrete. And, and people go, oh, shit, that's concrete. Anyway, um, at this point during the heat, Flair beat Sting to death but didn't hit him with shit that nobody could survive. Just one big move over and over. He was gut shotting him. He was hitting him across the back. He was chopping him. He was roughing him up. You got sympathy for Sting being beat the fuck out of, but at the same time, it wasn't ludicrous. Just move, 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 kick out, kick out, kick out. So when Sting finally does Sting up and starts coming back on Flair, they were fucking popping. But then Sting flies into the fucking post and Flair goes right back to the heat. Every time, almost, that Sting would blow a false comeback, as soon as he'd start blowing the false comeback, Flair would take a few bumps and then Flair wouldn't stop him, but he would have Sting stop himself, fly into the post, fly over the top as Flair ducks, whatever. It's a very subtle thing, but it's all about making the challenger get closer and closer as the match goes on. 30 minutes in, Flair starts working the leg. Now the Greensboro crowd instantly knows, well, he's going to try for the figure four because people were educated by repetition over and over of these things happening. So they knew what was going on. That helped. You don't get a fucking, you don't tease you're going to fucking work a guy's leg when you've never worked a guy's leg before on this promotion's television. But suddenly you're, oh shit, he's working the leg. Finally, Flair gets the figure four and he works on it for a long time and a long time. And finally, that when Sting is trying to come back, suddenly he called that spot. He told me one time, he said, I just looked at him. I said, fuck it, beat your chest. And Sting starts beating the chest while he's in the figure four. And Flair has that shit look on his face and Sting turns the figure four over and the place goes legitimately mental. And the only reason they didn't stay mental even longer was because once Sting turned it over, since he'd never done that before, he didn't know how to work it. So they just laid there. <laughs> and Sting tell, or Flair tells Tommy Young, untie me, get me out of here. <clears throat> but uh, a hold brought the house down. 
Then Flair goes back to the heat. He's calling a roller coaster. It's not going to be that easy for this kid. But at this point, he can't stay on top of Sting for 30 seconds or 45 seconds before Sting starts fighting back. He's Sting's getting stronger. Flair's getting weaker. Sting gets the figure four. They fucking love it. Flair's selling off the charts for this thing, screaming and paying. Oh, God, he's screaming, sweat's flying. And by the last few minutes of the match, Flair's desperate. Sting's kicking his ass all over ringside. Sting's invincible. Flair's bleeding slightly. They never called the blood again. Um, Sting goes for that stinger splash, and I don't think he meant to. I'm pretty sure he didn't mean to, but he went so high, he just went all the way over the fucking top when Flair moved. And that looked good. But by now they're down to three minutes and they're going back and in the last three minutes, they did three big false finishes <clears throat> that they built to and it made sense and they registered afterwards. And then Flair, by that point, the last minute, he's just telling Sting, don't sell anything. He's kicking him. He's punching him. Sting's bowing up. And finally... 30 seconds left. Sting hits the stinger splash and puts the scorpion on him. Can Flair hang on? 25 seconds. Oh, my God. The people are screaming, can he do it? Can he do it? They knew by that point he wasn't going to do it, but they were just loving it. And the time expires with Sting with the submission hold on the world champion. But ding, ding, ding. Sting is up in the corner and Flair's face down in the middle of the ring, and we've just made a new babyface superstar. Couldn't bell to bell. That was as good as Sting could be at that point in his life. And they go to break and they come back for the judging and it all falls to shit again because obviously the penthouse pet votes for Ric Flair. <laughs> Gary Jester votes for Sting because he's got to go back to the people in Baltimore and Sandy Scott, because he was a grumpy old fucker and he didn't care about taking the heat. He called it the draw and the people booed and there was no vote for Jason Hervey or Eddie Haskell even though people were standing around going, well, what do you got to say? Horrible stipulation with the judges, horrible execution of the judging, but one of the most famous wrestling matches in the history of television. A star-making performance. And uh, you just, there's nobody that can do these things anymore. I, there's no fans that can watch them because now that they've seen this other shit, you can't look at it the same way, and there's there's no wrestlers that can perpetrate it. Well, that's what I'm thinking, too, you know, to our earlier discussion about Luger and how good he got in 88, 89, 90, just a few years into the business, same thing with Sting. You know, they started probably right around the same time Sting was wrestling 1985. Yeah, well, I remember we just told a story here on one of these shows lately where I saw Sting and Warrior together in Louisville at Christmas of 85. And Sting... The only reason Sting wasn't the worst wrestler I'd ever seen is because he was standing next to the Ultimate Warrior. Um, and two years and four months later, he goes 45 minutes on national television in the highest rated cable wrestling match of all time against the best worker in the business and carries his end of it. And it says something about the talent in the wrestling business and Bill Watts' UWF and Jim Crockett promotions at this period of time that you could take a guy that initially is just a big steroid guy, can't move, can't do too much, but he's in there with the right people. He's in there with Ted DiBiase. He's in there with Ric Flair here. And obviously he has the aptitude to learn or do something different. I mean, Ultimate Warrior went a completely different direction. Well, and that's one thing you said, well, take a big steroid guy. I'm sure Sting had probably taken some supplements, and I'm not indicting him for that. He was a bodybuilder in those days. But Sting was never just a big steroid guy. When Ultimate he first Warrior. Started, no, when he first started and he well, was teaming with Ultimate Warrior, he was much bigger and, and, then. And he was bigger then, but here's the, he was always an athlete. It the athletic part of him was hidden because of the extra weight, the ultimate warrior was never an athlete. He was not coordinated. He was not as athletic. He had no cardio. He never did anything in a wrestling ring that would cause anybody who knows what they're talking about. To say he was an athlete. Sting was a fucking athlete. Warrior got even bigger and more clownish looking and more incoherent to go work for Vince and Sting studied from the guys he was in the ring with dropped weight so that he could move and those leapfrogs and drop kicks and stinger splashes 
And so he he was a he may have played the part of a big steroid guy at one time, but there was more to Sting than that. That's all Ultimate Warrior ever was. Right, and so, I wasn't saying you know, that as an indictment of Sting. I know, but I'm just saying, you know, you take the big steroid guy. Well, he had, you know he he did a lot for himself there, but he. He was just so much more athletic, and at that size and that build that he had here to be able to do those athletic things was amazing. Well, here's the other thing to think about. You know, I don't know how many guys today could start and within two and a half years, three years, be ready for a main event roster spot and not blow it. But Luger and Sting, I mean, unless I'm wrong, they weren't even wrestling fans. They were recruited into the business based on look, and they figured it out because of who they were working with. I mean, it really is remarkable when you think about it. I mean, the Road Warriors, too, even though that's a little different. These guys that weren't wrestling fans, like so many guys. I mean, today, everyone who's a wrestler grew up a wrestling fan, pretty much. Not everyone, but you know what I mean. Back then, there were guys who had no interest in wrestling and got into it because they needed a job. And they figured out how to make it work. It really is astounding. Yeah. Well, and... <laughs> And back then, to be honest, we always we looked down at those guys that were never fans of the business because they didn't know how that it was supposed to look, and you had to lead them and explain it to them, and the learning curve was harder. But now, the guys that get in the business that have been wrestling fans, they're the ones with all the bad habits that you. it's too late to break. They don't know what this shit's supposed to look like. They know what it looks like now. So if you get somebody that really has not been a wrestling fan and is a great athlete, you could actually train them and have a better chance of coming out with a compli- an accomplished pro wrestler than with these fucking guys that are watching what they think wrestling is supposed to be because you can't break those bad habits. Anyway, that's basically the situation that launched Sting's full-time main event spot level major league wrestling career there and you know it would end up being you know flair sting and luger until the mid 90s would be synonymous with the top guys in the company but it was all back to to this match on that particular tv special but we've saved the best for last brian (laughs) that's right I will, I'll, I'll preface this and then we'll, we'll sync everything up. We'll tell everybody how, but basically I've told part of this story before the idea to bring Bobby Fulton and Tommy Rogers, the fantastics into Charlotte was mine because at that time we had gone through some substandard programs, me and the midnight, the new breed had a car accident. Nikita quit the business Uh, We were working a little bit with Nikita and Dusty, but he quit the business. His wife got sick and he had taken that time off and just a bunch of shit had not coalesced for us in about six months. And and we knew we needed to get back in the picture, being able to do what we can do, which is tear the house down, having a match and a baby face team that we can get some sympathy on and get some heat over. And Bobby and Tommy were, I believe, in Dallas at that time, which was really in bad shape business wise. And I'd call Bobby. I said, if I can get you here, will you come? And he, of course. So I sat down with Dusty and I made the big pitch. I said, these guys are the best baby face team in the ring in the business. It's the closest we can get to recreating the magic with the rock and roll express. Um, Here's an idea for how we can bring them in and make a blah, blah, blah. And he went for it. And my thought was that we would do the first match, the midnight express with the United States tag team champions. We'd beaten everybody and blah, 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 and done all this and that. So we'll just take on the Fantastics in a match on syndicated TV. A new tag team coming in, blah, blah, blah. It's a non-title match because since they haven't been in the NWA before, obviously they wouldn't be in line for a United States tag team title match. And we put them over. That was on the first syndicated television program that we did with them. They beat us by using our own rocket launcher finish against us non-title but holy shit and people as you remember they went fucking wasn't that in norfolk virginia i believe it was they went nuts so then we come back the clash of champions and this is all in the first couple of weeks the fantastics had been in the territory and we hadn't even started working with them in the house shows yet but i also knew that while we needed to give the fantastics credibility if they beat the midnight express one two three with our own fucking move uh, clean in the middle of the ring, then that means the fans know that they're supposed to take them seriously. But 
that also means that they got the last word on us. That there's no reason to to buy a ticket to see the matches at the house shows or give a fuck because we didn't do anything to the Fantastics. So in this match where they get a U.S. tag title match because they've beaten the champions a week or two before, this time we got to end up with heat. It was Dusty's finish. The previous, the syndication match was mine. This was Dusty's finish, but that's all he gave us was the finish. He wanted to do the two referee thing. He wanted to tease that the Fantastics had won the belts, but then we, the, the, that gets reversed and we get some heat on him. I was never a fan of the second referee finish after Eddie Graham did it the first time and it worked in the 60s <laughs> because it, it can't plausibly happen on a regular basis that this same quirk of fate keeps happening, but it was overdone. Uh, but as okay, we got the double referee thing, but we're going to, you know, certainly we'll tear the house down with everything else. And that's when, besides getting there and being surprised by Eddie Haskell, we got there and they told us because of the long match in the main event, because of the television time constraints, eight minutes for the match. That would mean 10 minutes with entrances in and out, right? And we were, I was dumbfounded because we never had big show matches that short. And this was, I was still learning the peculiarities of live television, et cetera. We never had house show matches that short. We never had big show matches that short. Our thing with the Fantastics, the way this was going to get over, was that we go out and have the great tag team matches. And Bobby and Tommy's teamwork was so good. And they had great double team moves. And so did we. And we would shine the baby faces with all this action. And then we'd get heat on them and make them sell and get sympathy on them. It's hard to do that that quick. So we we didn't have a match planned. You didn't do that back then. But we obviously, because we'd worked together so many times, so many different places, we had shit we were planning to do. Eight minutes with an angle afterwards. Eight, ten minutes for introductions, entrances, match, and angle afterwards. Ah, uh, fuck. So we went back and sat down, and I said, the only way we can do this is just to go back to Memphis. And if we're going to give them ten minutes, it's going to be the goddamnedest ten minutes they've ever seen in their life. And there's no reason for a baby face, hot baby faces to hit the ring and jump start it because they beat us in the only time that we've met. So they wanted me in the ring to introduce the midnight coming out of break because we're the recognized team. That'll snag them. And then the Fantastics to come out second. I said, why wouldn't we jump them before they got their feet under them? Let the heels jump start it. And because we're pissed that we got beat, but then the baby faces turn the fucking tables and then it's a schmoz and we're in fucking Memphis and we went in with, okay, we're going to, we're going to go crazy. We're going to brawl. Uh, then we're, we're, we kept a, a spot that I'd been intending to do in a regular match that we'll talk about when we see it, where Bobby and Tommy come out from the uh, defensive end and shoot Bobby and Stan off and they do the double upside downs. That's a match that or a spot that I was thinking about. We'd do in a match that I thought we might have. Um, we had a heat spot, which was the double goozle on Tommy Rogers. That'll start the real heat. And then we had our finish, which was a false tag. And with Bobby Fulton drawing the referee, telling him to get out that we would triple up on, Tommy Rogers and Bobby would just lose his fucking mind and throw the referee over the top rope and attack us. And then the Fantastics would come out on top with the rocket launcher again. Second referee would slide in one, two, three and count it. People would think they were the new champions, but the first referee would come back in, take the belts away, call the DQ, and then we get some heat. That's what we had down in our minds to do for this match that we're about to look at. And we figured the rest of it will all take place as it happens. <clears throat> and that's pretty much what we did. And we had the misfortune of being underneath the match of the year because we got fucking runner up match of the year on the same fucking show. And what was the observer and Matt watch and all those different places that people voted back then, because this was different it was not only was it a different Midnight Express match, it was a different kind of match. Most of the NWA matches weren't exactly like this. This was good old-fashioned Memphis 
wild shit. And it, that type of th- stuff wasn't called because you couldn't call it because you didn't really know what was going to happen until you got out there. So we used to just say, that's what Lawler would give a match. The first 10 minutes of the match, he'd just say, just wild. <laughs> and 10 minutes later, now get some heat. That was the instruction you got, wild. Just be wild. I'm sure there's something that I can't think of right now, but off the top of my head, I think this may have been like the wildest match anyone would have seen on TV. I mean, you didn't have matches like this on TV where it was just a brawl around ringside. I mean, now it's commonplace, and I think it's important to reinforce that because someone who wasn't around back then or hasn't really gone through any of that old footage, they may think, oh, tag team wrestling was like this, just wild brawls. There was nothing like this on TV on WWF or NWA TV at the time. No, because uh, even if you had a main event match on free television, which was still rare in those days, it was done as an as an angle or to increase interest or whatever. And but you still <laughs> only in Memphis did they just say fuck it. You know, that was a, it was a Memphis main event. We're just going to tear shit. We're going to rattle furniture around, tear shit up. No, you did not see uh, main event level matches, much less wild brawls on free television in those days. And so this was especially, holy shit, but it was different also than the other NWA matches because Crockett Promotions in the 70s, you know, they had been even more conservative. In the 70s, Crockett's house shows, uh, first match was always a 20-minute Broadway because that got the people in their seats because they're running big buildings. They got thousands of people to sit down. Nothing before intermission was allowed to have any contact on the floor with each other whatsoever. No fighting on the floor before intermission. Uh, A lot of strict rules because they were concentrating on building their main events and their money matches. When Dusty took the book, he loosened things up considerably and brought more of a Florida flavor into things. But still, here's another thing I guess I should mention before we watch this. Not a goddamn person had a clue we were going to do any of this. We went out and did it on our own. And Bobby and Tommy were kind of shitting because they'd only been there for two weeks. But we said, look, we'll take the fucking heat. (laughs) We're going to do this. We're going to use some shit because we're going to give them 10 goddamn minutes they're going to remember. And we're going to break some shit to do it. But if it sucks, we'll take the heat and we're going to get yelled at. It's not your fault. You're the new guys. And if it's good... Nobody's going to say anything to us because it was so fucking good. We did not get any heat. But anyway. What do you think Tully and Arn were thinking watching this, knowing they have to have a big match later in the show? They were thinking those motherfuckers, they got to go on first. (laughs) Well, and all, but also, but they had Barry Windham and Lex Luger. Two big main event, and I'm not even talking about quality of talent between the Fantastics and Wyndham and Luger. I'm talking about two guys recognized with track records as main event stars, and we have two baby faces that the people in North Carolina have seen once on television. <clears throat> so we needed a little fucking pick me up. Uh, they had some, and also theirs was the World Tag Title. Ours was just ours was just the United States Tag Title, and they got a little bit more time. So everything worked out and they tore the house down too. Anyway, how are we going to tell the people how to set this thing up? Okay. A few different things. Obviously go to the WWE network. If you are a subscriber and go to clash of the champions one, once you are there, you can go to the timestamp 1551, 15 minutes and 51 seconds into the broadcast. Pause it. And we will begin at that point. An easier way, if you have the option underneath the video player, to jump to a specific segment. Obviously, just click the one that says Midnight Express versus Fantastics U.S. Tag Titles. It will take you right to this point. 1551. Jim, having, are, <laughs> I was about to say, having said that, are you ready? All right, Jim. Well, if we're ready to go, what we're going to do is we're going to count down from five. We're going to say one, and then after one, click play. <laughs> what, is it three or after the one, two, three, go, or one, two, go on three? Exactly. That's the problem yeah. I'm anticipating everyone out yeah. there having. So right now, 1551 is the time. Clash of the Champions won in five, four, three, two, one. Press play. Boom. And there's my lovely face. That's what the viewers came back to. 
Uh, actually, they came back to a one-second shot of the Cornet for President banner, which they apparently edited out here. I don't know. Anyway, I hate that middle aisle. Look, no people. That's the first time they used it for TV and had the barricades back. It was great for people not attacking you, but it was an empty fucking blotch when you looked at it from the hard camera. I just I didn't like that. Anyway, you notice the Midnight Express introduced and in the ring in 45 seconds. We ain't wasting any time. Hello to the girl in the red. I haven't seen you in a long time. Um, wish I could remember what her name was. Anyway, Pee Wee Anderson, the referee, Pee Wee was the one who famously ripped his shirt off and did Hulk Hogan poses on the uh, bar of the lighthouse in Alexandria when Dr. Death and Hercules Hernandez beat the whole bar up. Here comes Bobby and Tommy. There's a Bobby ear, ear tug to say hello to his girlfriend right there. There we go. <clears throat> and now, boom, less than a minute and a half in. Here we go. Ding, ding. Tom Miller didn't know this was going to happen, and he can't get the <laughs> fuck out of there. We told nobody what we were going to do. We just said, fuck it. Here we go. But the people were into it because they'd seen the TV. They knew what the fuck. They knew we were mad. Um, I love this part here. Stan takes his own post. <laughs> <laughs> They're calling us as they go. And I want Bobby's rolling concrete bumps. Boom. And coming up here in a second, Bobby's Bobby Eaton, too many Bobbies. Bobby Eaton's trying to tell Bobby Fulton, just stop, duck. There we go. Boom. Shit. Oh. And watch this in the middle of this craziness. Here in a second, Stan and Tommy Rogers are going to do a drop down hip toss leapfrog. Right? And <laughs> Stan loved that. In the middle of goddamn brawl, he's doing drop down leapfrogs. It, 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 you just had to keep the shit moving. And poor uh, Pee Wee trying to take control of shit. Now watch this. Bobby wanted to do something here. Bobby Eaton did. And they wouldn't settle down and listen to him. He's trying to gouge everybody's eyes. And finally he just says, fuck it. I'll go out here. I told Stan, I said, uh, I'm calling for a chair spot. I said, run him into the fucking chair. While the Bobbies are throwing the table around. Here we go. Tommy Rogers head first in the chair. The photographers are running. I mean, I guess we are used to it. And plus, you know, I started in Memphis, but you're right. Nobody was doing this shit on TV back then. Nobody. And it's not like everybody was cooperating, to try to build this erector set of, you know, tables and chairs and ladders to climb onto. We're just hitting people with blunt instruments as they happened by. How dangerous is that table with the legs up? Uh, well, it wasn't supposed to be there that way, and we didn't have time to worry about it. It'll come back into play in a second. Bobby Fulton also was not happy when, when he caught one of those chairs that cut his palm of his hand. Anyway, now you see this. Boom. Where are they going here? I'm pretty sure coming up. We're going into, ah, yes, the blind tag. Boom. There's the blind tag hand to hand by the Fantastics behind Bobby's back. Uh-oh. That was a spot actually I'd come up with. We were going to do in the original tag match, and it still made it. But yeah, coming up into the double upside down. Bobby Eaton hated this. He hadn't done this bump in five years, and he missed it. He didn't quite hang it. Stan got his. Um, but once again, the people are, oh, shit, because they're people flying everywhere. And it looks like a fight. You don't have to stop and cooperate. Um, here, just in a couple of seconds, I believe is where, yeah, remember I told you I was wearing a watch, so I was keeping time. And right here in a second, I'm going to buzz the boys. It's time for the heat spot, which we knew was the double goozle on Tommy. I think, yeah, as a matter of fact, I just told Stan, uh, yeah, I'm telling Stan, eh, time for the heat. Covering your mouth with the racket. Yes, <laughs> Stan buzzed Bobby. Let's get to heat. Here we go. Tag, reversal. Rogers doesn't know the other guy's legal double goozle. Boom. Now we've changed the tide. Now we have, uh, we're in this so far for less than five minutes. We've got to get some fucking heat. And you can listen to the fans. During the time they were getting the heat on Tommy, every time he would fucking fire up or throw a punch or fight back or show some life. They were into it with him. We didn't give him time to stop and fucking dwell on what else was going on in the world. They were in this moment. Um, 
I d- here's this kick. Tommy Rogers was the right height, and his selling was so good. It's the best Stan Lane's kicks ever looked. <laughs> and well, no, I'm mean, seriously. It, it takes it takes yeah. both. It takes both people. And plus, Tommy was. He would go up like a feather on a slam. Tommy Rogers, I could slam him. I looked like Harley Race. I tried to pick up Bobby Fulton. He felt like Happy Humphrey. And now, boom, Bobby decides about this time, oh, I've just told Stan, draw the referee. Because I told Bobby when he was on the apron, next time you get in, throw Tommy into the table. Boom, there's the table spot. (laughs) The table was laying there. I've never seen anyone else do that spot. Okay, well, it it was laying there. And what the fuck? So I told Stan, get in and draw the referee. I told Bobby while he was on the apron, the next time you jump in, just throw Tommy in the table. The funny part was Bobby had had picked Tommy Rogers up and said, watch the table. And Tommy said, what table? And he told me later, all of a sudden he saw this table rising up like out of a, out of the fucking ground. And he ran into it. Boom. But that's when, when you're calling something, that's what you say. You're going to punch somebody, watch the fist. You're going to shoot somebody off for an elbow, watch the elbow. Watch the table. And watch this. This is fucking beautiful. Boom, Bobby, power slam, boom, and it hurt him, and he couldn't capitalize. Oh, but now he gets over. Oh, is he going to cover? No, he's not. He's going to the top. <clears throat> Bobby's just realized he hadn't come off the top yet. You got to get one of those in. We're rushing. I admit, we're rushing. And now is when he's hurt himself and he couldn't cover. And he makes the tag out. Tommy Rogers is great at selling. Oh, my God. And just the body language and the limp raggedness. Um, nice side salto. And then Stan wants to draw Bobby in one more time. And I think coming up here shortly, we may be getting into the... Uh, Oh, no, it's still a couple minutes yet before we get into the bad part, the, Tommy, the worst part of Tommy's night. But see, now they're, they're being vicious. They're gouging his eyes. They're beating him up. They're cutting the ring off. Stan on the fly called something. So Bobby said, instead of coming back in, I'll come off here. Boom. Done. Do you see any obvious mistakes? Do you see anybody standing around waiting, trying to figure out what to fucking do? And they don't know what this is the big part. They're not trying to stand around, standing around figuring out what to do because they don't know what they're going to do next until they do it. <clears throat> Can you imagine trying to remember all this shit and make it look natural? Just go with the fucking flow. Look at Bobby or Tommy firing back. Listen to the people. And then watch these fucking shots. Boom. <laughs> It's not a UFC punch, but you can't tell it's bullshit. I hate that wide shot. I believe I've mentioned that big empty area where there should be people on the floor. And once again, Stan just said sunset flip. But Bobby, the referee was with Bobby Fulton. So Bobby Eaton gets a chance to fuck. It's a hope spot. Simple as that. Doesn't require a lot of advanced pre-planning. Now we're coming up on the part. Stan goes to tag Bobby. Bobby says, no, dump him out. Stan says, okay. Stan's going to dump him out on the floor. Did you see me just look at my watch? I'm saying, we barely got any time left. You actually saw me show Bobby the wrist. <laughs> <clears throat> now, referee's backing Bobby Fulton up. Bobby Eaton has seen this. Why not? It's a flat table. Eep, boom, flat slam. Holy shit, you don't see that every day, and it was jarring. And that's, you know, now I've told Bobby, I said, we, we got to be going any old time now. Right. And as as a matter of fact, I think I'm passing that word on. I said, don't worry, we're going right there. When I was over the top of the announce desk, what we didn't realize was that Bobby is going to add this one little thing. That's going to cost us an extra minute. Bobby decides he wants to bulldog Tommy Rogers on the table. Now the shot is the shits, but he bulldogs Tommy Rogers on the table. Bobby Eaton's weight hit one side and it flipped the other side up. So instead of going flat, look at there's concern. Instead of going flat, the side of Tommy's face blasted into the table that was flipping up. It deviated his septum. It, I don't know if it broke his nose or just dislocated it. And his eye uh, started swelling up and he's starting to go blind. Bobby's still saying hello to his girlfriend, <laughs> but Tommy Rogers is telling him, that he doesn't know what fucking time it is right now. And Pee Wee's trying to say, get back to the corner. We got Pee Wee saying, go home, go home. 
Bobby Fulton saying we're going to, and Tommy Rogers is saying, what time does the bus get here? Cause he doesn't know what the fuck's going on. We're losing a minute. Finally, we determined that Tommy can continue. Actually, we didn't ter- determine that. He just crawled back close enough. We could get him. Tommy Rogers at this point actually cannot see he's blind. The optic nerve has been pressed on. And Stan says, watch this, drop toe hold elbow. And Tommy says, "I." what Stan said first said, are you okay? And Tommy said, I can't see. And then Stan said, drop toe hold elbow and just held on to him all the way to the ropes and back. So Tommy couldn't see where he was going, but he didn't have to. And now Bobby's like, all right, can, can we get through with this? And uh, there's a little more vamping. And then finally say, okay, we we can do this. We're going to get it. Just fire up. Boom, boom, boom. Block, shot on Stan. Dive over, makes the tag, but the referee doesn't see it. And Tommy's like, thank God this shit's almost over. Fucking here's the the triple team behind the referee's back. Bobby Fulton throws Pee Wee over the top and says, fuck it. I'm going to take matters in my own hands. Here was just a little nod to boom, a racket shot so I can take the bump. And this sets up the rocket launcher in the perfect place. And Bobby trying to fucking get up back down in the right position, right in the nick of time. Second referee, Tommy Young. And listen to that crowd. Tommy Rogers still can't figure out where the fuck he's at. When he went back in the locker room and blew his nose, both of his eyes swelled up shut completely with blood. And he had to take, I forget whether it was a week off or what the fuck it was, but his whole goddamn face was fucked. And there he's supposed to go into the post, but he didn't get it good. So he tells Stan, he said, give it to me again. Okay. Whoop, into the post. Now we've got poor Bobby Fulton. Well, further than Pee Wee was not happy about that one. Um, We're we're over time now. We've been out here for, this has only been not even 13 minutes. Bobby hurt his fucking wrist on that because he we rushed it and he put his hands down instead of taking them on his forearms. But here's the meat of the matter. This is going to end up in June at the Great America, July at the Great American Bash with the Fantastics whipping me. But this is March and we're going to whip the shit out of him. And I apologize to Bobby beforehand, but he was screaming, Tommy, 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 anybody help me. <laughs> You really went and, to town uh, on him. until poor Tommy comes in with the fucking chair and still is <laughs> practically beat to death. And then one Tommy Young will not let me forget about this one to this day. Corny, God damn it. Um, and that's how you in less than 13 minutes tear the fucking Greensboro Coliseum apart. And nobody yelled at us because it was good. Except Pee Wee saw the steps down there at the nick of time and didn't take a very good bump. I hate middle middle stairs as well because that's an injury looking to happen. Nice looking racket shot. Decent bump for the fucking fat manager. And there you have it. Well, your winners, and that, the Midnight Express by disqualification. By disqualification. And then that led to the match that we had in May in, I believe it was May or maybe late April in Chattanooga at the UTC arena, where we had that third in the trilogy that everybody makes over where we went the whole hour on syndicated television and they did beat us after a teased referee stoppage and did win the fucking match. And that when Bobby Eaton had 102 degree fever and had been throwing up all day and Bobby Fulton lost some fucking I think he was, he was juiced in that one. Wasn't he? He lost some blood. Anyway, this was my favorite match out of the bunch because we overachieved with the spot that we were given, but, uh, the other two were better tag team wrestling matches in my opinion. And there you have it. What a way to close the show. We've been doing this for like six hours now. Well, but it doesn't seem that long. See, instead of AEW has a two-hour show, it seems like it takes five hours to watch. We just had a 12-and-a-half-minute match. Seemed like it went by in seconds. What are we doing next week? Who the fuck knows? (laughs) (laughs) Let's see who's still employed in the wrestling business. And here's another thing, folks. I've said many times if they'd had cell phones and internet in the 80s, 
no wrestler would have been married longer than two weeks and, and everybody would have been in jail. Nothing's changed except the matches. But I'll tell you what, speaking from somebody who is not currently charged with any crimes and my wife ain't mad at me, I think I'm doing pretty good. So until next week, uh, and we'll do something else that's equally as fun as what we've done today, I think it's time to say thank you and fuck you and bye-bye, everybody. Don't you, Brian? I think so. Thank you, fuck you, bye-bye, everybody.